So before I start, Amar, I'm going to uh, sort of, you know, share my screen. So just let me know if you can see my screen. See my screen? Yeah. Okay, doke. Okay, okay. So all good. Go. Fantastic. So I'm just launching my presentation. Perfect. Okay, so we're we gonna mute. To uh, yeah. Yeah, we just need to mute people to make sure. Uh, so we have we have a IT person doing that. That's all good, right? And Amar, you're going to be admitting people from the from the waiting room. Yes. Yeah, brilliant, fantastic. Okay, doke. Right. So, uh, welcome all once again to Gulpain School's rehabilitation section. So we do have a rehab section uh, of the Gulpain School, and uh, welcome all to the physical medicine and pain medicine integrated approach. Uh, what's new? So what we're going to do is to go through a few slides in terms of introduction, uh, and that will allow people to join us. Uh, and we will, once we've checked in, we will uh, start with the scientific program. So with regards to the Gulf Pain School, uh, we, I just thought I'll play this introductory video. We do have a lot of people probably new uh, to She's us there. and we're new to them. So I thought we will just play this video. That way, you know, it will tell us, tell you guys, that what we do uh, at Gulf Pain School. So just a short video and followed by that, then we'll go through the instructions and then we'll go on to, we dive, we dive into the scientific program. So watch the video. Oops. So basically, uh, that's what it's all about, the Gulf Pain School. Uh, we ran our first cadaver course in February this year, uh, which was a big hit. Uh, we had all the other courses lined up, but unfortunately, because of COVID, we had to kind of, you know, change the way we deliver the pain education. Uh, but, you know, that didn't stop us because we managed to run 26 different webinars on various practical topics, and we have been running virtual courses. So uh, course program for today, we have kind of, you know, check in housekeeping. Uh, then we'll do introduction and instructions. I'll introduce you to our faculty who have taken a lot of efforts to basically, you know, uh, put the program together as well as to work on the presentations. Uh, 2.30, we'll start with this topic, which is actually quite uh, a useful topic uh, for everyone post-stroke hemiplegic shoulder pain, a very difficult pain problem, uh, and also quite debilitating for patients and also quite frustrating at times for <coughs> rehab physicians. All about that, we have a uh, you know, talk on shoulder joint denervation uh, and then uh, sort of, you know, talk on knee osteoarthritis, physiatrist strategies of treatment. And then myself and uh, Dr. Salty from Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi will do the talk joint talk on knee joint denervation, uh, what's new, 
Then we'll have a coffee break for 10 minutes, uh, followed by that. Then we have uh, management of MSK issues after spinal cord injury, uh, deep luteal pain syndrome, carpal tunnel syndrome, and median nerve hydrodissection. Uh, excellent videos on median nerve hydrodissection. So, you know, uh, do hang around. We have a really good talk slide up after the coffee break as well. And then you'll we'll also go on to a very important topic, which isn't commonly discussed, uh, uh, but something that can be kind of managed properly if you have a better understanding and knowledge is pelvic pain management. And we will close the meeting at seven o'clock. Okie doke. Right. So, uh, housekeeping, please identify yourself, uh, mute yourself. Uh, we don't want uh, any background noises because that disturbs the speaker. Uh, questions in the chat box. Uh, recordings will be available on Girl Pain School's uh, sort of, you know, uh, website. Uh, we would actually put the recording beforehand onto the Girl Pain School Facebook page, as well as on the YouTube channel. Uh, email, sort of, you know, we will kind of, you know, uh, try and see whether we can get you, get you guys to give us a feedback. Now, with regards to the faculty on today's course, uh, you know, this is our rehab section uh, of the Gulf Pain School. We have a faculty from all over the world. Uh, we have faculty from Taiwan, Prof. Wen Xiang Chen, a very well-known kind of, you know, uh, a, a PMR physician in Taiwan. We have got uh, Dr. Harpreet Sang, who is a faculty today. Uh, he's from uh, Toronto, University of Toronto. Then we have Dr. Rohit Bide, who is from uh, Sheffield <laughs> University in the UK. And we have uh, Dr. Poonam Pal, she's a physiotherapist, but has done a PhD from New Zealand. Uh, we have faculty, Dr. Mittal, Nimish Mittal from the University of Toronto, uh, Dr. Abdullah Alam from uh, University of Tanta in Egypt, and Dr. Ahmed Qureshi, uh, who's a physiatrist uh, in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. So we have faculty from various parts of the world. Uh, so, you know, I'm sure you will find, you know, this particular session very, very helpful. Uh, we just wanted to highlight why do we kind of, you know, say our GPS courses are different because we work on a simple, keep it simple principle. Our courses are very much practical. We don't bog it down with overwhelming information. Our lectures are short. We give you clinical pearls. We tell you what exactly we would do in that particular scenario and uh, help you to manage patients well. Now, uh, our presentations are on scientifically based um, uh, of sort of, you know, psychology of learning, you know, we as a uh, kind of human beings, uh, we like kind of, you know, uh, things that have been taught in the form of storytelling. So our courses, when we run, they, we have a case-based scenarios. Uh, we, we remember beginning and the end better. We try and give you lectures in the form of short lectures for maximum attention, because we know nowadays, anything more than 20 minutes, you start to lose your attention. Uh, we have more pictures and content. Uh, so, you know, if you guys want more information about the Gulf Pain School, please visit our website. I'll run through a website for two minutes at the end uh, of this. Uh, so we have run 26 different webinars on practical topics. Uh, we have online courses on joint innovation and spinal pain management. I'll show that to you in a minute on the website. Headache, facial pain, fascial pain blocks. Uh, we've got a webinar on cancer pain, pelvic pain. MSK, peripheral nerve entrapments, all of them are available uh, in the form of lessons. As I said, you know, we are a school. Uh, we just don't give you like a three hour long clip of webinar. We divide them into lessons so you can buy them. You can watch them on demand like you watched on Netflix or Amazon Prime. Uh, you can go back to the same topic. Uh, you can watch as many times as you want. So, you know, they are all available. What's coming soon? Uh, January, we have upper limb MSK and peripheral neuromodulation uh, kind of a virtual course. Uh, we have this uh, lined up for Jan 2021. Followed by that in February, we are running a lower limb MSK and peripheral neuromodulation course. Our course content is very much kept, as I said, very practical. What are the indications? Anatomy, skeletal anatomy, ultrasound videos. Uh, we're going to have live demos. We'll show you how we scan the particular structure and what would be the needle approach. And we have faculty from different, different parts of the world. So this is our kind of flyer for the upper limb MSK course uh, and a flyer of lower limb MSK course. So you see we have a faculty uh, and, and a scientific committee members from various parts of the world. 
Uh, who are the faculty? We do have a radiology faculty. So I think the way we decided to do this, we want you to learn from the experts. So we're going to have a diagnostic ultrasound, diagnostic MRI scan sessions taught by the radiologists. We have, and these are uh, MSK radiologists, not general radiologists, MSK radiologists. We have Dr. Ajay Sahu, uh, Dr. Ganesh Ratnasingam, Dr. Siddeshwar Dayal, and Dr. Arif Saeed. So the, these people are the experts uh, in diagnostic uh, ultrasound and MRI, MSK, MRI scans. So, and then we have faculty from various parts of the world as I said, uh, Dr. Al Abdullah Al, 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 Al Karabshe from Jordan. He's currently working in Taiwan. So he's one of our faculties today. We've got Dr. Tolga Ergonak from Turkey. Feliz Galuccio from uh, Italy and Mario Fazado Perez. Uh, he's very well known for ultra dissection. Uh, so he's going to show us some anatomy pro sections and he's also going to tell us about the anatomy and applied anatomy. And uh, myself, Dr. Sadiq Bayani, I'm from Leicester, UK. Dr. Amasalti from Abu Dhabi Cleveland Clinic. Uh, Dr. Bansali, Dr. Kamau, mm. Dr. Gulati from Liverpool in the UK. Dr. Riyadh from UAE. Uh, Abu Dhabi and then Dr. Tolba also from Abu Dhabi. And we have Dr. Stanley Lam, very well known uh, pain physician from Hong Kong, very well known for his uh, hydrodissection with 5% dextrose. And he's, he's published a lot on that. And uh, then we have Dr. George Ching from uh, United States, from California. Uh, he's very well known for regenerative medicine. So George will be talking to us about the regenerative medicine. And we have Dr. N.R. Otestad, <coughs> from Stanford University in USA. He will be telling us about the upper limb and lower limb peripheral neuromodulation. So we've got an excellent world-class faculty lined up for the January and Fab February course. We are on various social media platforms, guys. So do join us. I know uh, we are on LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. So, you know, we can keep you updated. I will put up a WhatsApp link. Uh, so if you guys want to join a WhatsApp group, we will then we can keep you updated with our upcoming courses. So that's all from my side. Thank you so much. So I'm going to just quickly take you guys through to uh through the through the through the through the website so are you able to still see my screen yes yeah it's perfect so we had the overview on uh, the gps now we're gonna go through the website yes absolutely so we will just quickly run through the website so we can show you the various features and we we, we have plenty of uh, free content too we have a whole webinar series that we have put up on the website so you know, do 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 access that. Uh, so this is basically our GPS website. Uh, we have recorded videos on the simulator. I think this is we are the first ones to actually you know after Nisura to do this. Uh, so we have a simulation videos on shoulder joint interventions. So there's a simulator section here, uh, and we have webinar sections. So obviously, you know, as I said, we have ran webinar in the form of series. And we have a good kind of, you know, six series of webinars here. Uh, the first series, you guys can access, that's free. And we've got uh, series two on MSK Regenerative Medicine, Joint Innovation Webinar Series. And then we have Fascial Plane Block Series. And then we have Cancer Pain and Pelvic Pain Series. So in addition to that, if you go on to the course section, we have state-of-the-art virtual course series here. And then we have spinal pain management and joint innovation course. So you guys can access this, even though we finished our spinal pain management course this month, but the recordings or the lessons are available for you to view. And that's been kind of, you know, approved for 12 CPD points. Joint innovation course is approved for eight CPD points. So, you know, do, do get the access uh, and uh, do enjoy. And if you guys have any questions, do drop us an email on gulfpainschool at gmail.com. So without further delay, I'm now going to hand it over to Dr. Salty, and then we will get on and do our talks on the on the today's webinar. So Amar, are you there? Can you? Yeah. So welcome, everyone. Okay. So as Sadiq stated uh, earlier, we have an international faculty. We are uh, glad to offer this knowledge and to spread the knowledge about uh, chronic pain and interventional pain management. So today's program is bas basically on uh, rehabilitation, physical and medicine rehabilitation and regenerative medicine. We're gonna go through the shoulder, um, the joint innervation of the knee, and uh, very interesting topics on the spinal cord injuries, 
And the first speaker will be our friend from Saudi Arabia. We're trying to get him in. Yes. Hello. Dr. Ahmad, he's, yes, he's here. You. Great. Can you hear me well? Yes. We can hear you well. Perfect. Yes. Awesome. So just going to quickly introduce you guys to, to sort of uh, Ahmed Qureshi. So Ahmed is actually a, a really, really good kind of, you know, uh, PMR physician from Riyadh. He's currently working in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and he's actually our kind of, you know, uh, program lead uh, for rehab. He's worked on a really good program for the cadaver course, the spasticity workshop, which we were planning to run, uh, Botox uh, and spasticity workshop. And uh, he does plenty of work uh, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, excellent speaker. So, Amar, the floor is yours. Uh, you can uh, share your screen and uh, take us through the journey of the hemiplegic shoulder pain. Thank you. Yes. Great. Thanks a lot. Just click on share screen, Dr. Ahmad, down there in the bottom. Uh, yes. Can you? Green screen, me? yes. Because it says host disabled. Right. Give me two minutes. Let me make sure that you are basically... No worries. Two yeah. Here you go. Okay. Right. So I'm going to make you co-host now, Ahmed. Here you go. Just there's my co-host. Yep. Fantastic. So you can now Perfect. see your yep. screen. You can see your screen. Thank you so much. Sure. Brilliant. Awesome. Fantastic. Enjoy. Very good. Thank you. That's great. Great. So the screen is full screen on your end? All good, all good. That's fantastic. Awesome. Great. So I'm going to be talking about the hemiplegic shoulder pain post-stroke. And uh, since the theme is uh, what's new, um, I'm not going to have a detailed overview on the hemiplegic shoulder pain, but I'm going to review some of the interesting trials which are done in the last five years in context of the guidelines, which are commonly applicable globally. Um, I'm going to include, exclude the complex regional pain syndrome. I believe it's an entirely different topic and it needs more dedicated time too. Uh, so there are various guidelines uh, which are inclusive of uh, hemiplegic shoulder pain. There's one guideline from uh, NICE in 2013 in the UK. They are currently working on updating the guidelines. Um, AHA guidelines since 2016 in the US have not been updated yet. Uh, there are guidelines from the uh, Foundation, which are endorsed by the National Health and Medical Research Council in Australia from 2017. And I would want to say the mother of all guidelines is the Canadian Guidelines, Evidence-Based Review of Stroke Rehabilitation. Uh, interestingly, they have been working on these guidelines since 2002. That's their 19th edition. And that is one of the most inclusive set of guidelines available with us. So what is next? Uh, we are expecting some guidelines to come up in uh, February 2021, uh, which is going to... I guess somebody... Ahmed, give me two more. minutes. Let me mute everyone and then you... I muted it. I muted it. I muted it. It's okay. Go ahead. Thank you. That's great. Right. So in February 2021, we are expecting some international perspective uh, by Prof Professor Thomas Platz, uh, who has been working with international experts... Um, under the umbrella of World Federation of Neural Rehabilitation. And um, he had rationalized this document based on a mini review guideline, which was published back in 2019, in which he reviewed all the guidelines uh, published back then over the last 10 years. And he reviewed 16 guidelines and came up with the recommendation that there needs to be a new format of evidence synthesis to link best evidence to practice recommendations. In short, um, you know, there's too much information and there's a gap between theory and practice. So he had suggested to come up with evidence of systematic reviews and to devise a multi-step approach in clinical problem solving. There is a lot of information out there, but how to execute this information into clinical practice is a challenge for uh, clinicians given the vast amount of evidence and literature available out there. And the idea is to have regional or uh, local clinical pathways, which could be improvised based, based on different health systems. So creating a little bit of background, there are factors specific to stroke causing hemiplegic shoulder pain. Uh, 
One of the factors is the impaired motor control, which is not necessarily limiting to the tonicity, but it also refers to the mechanical imbalance, association of subluxation and abnormal scapulohumeral rhythm uh, in context of tonicity and power. Uh, that leads to uh, multiple soft tissue lesions. As we know of, uh, most of the times the pain are, is referred to the soft tissue lesions in a hemiplegic shoulder pain. But there's an, another aspect to that is the altered neural activity. So if I have to summarize, uh, it's not only the mechanical factors or the neural factors which are directly responsible for contributing to hemiplegic shoulder pain, there is an also an interplay between these factors along with the soft tissue lesions. So it is, uh, as Sarik has mentioned in the beginning, it is a pretty, pretty complex problem. So given the multifactorial nature of the problem, hemiplegic shoulder pain is not a diagnosis itself. It is multifactorial, as was shown in the previous slide. It is, I wouldn't say it is a complex problem. I would say that it is a very, very complex problem. And um, so much so that we really need to emphasize to work on the prevention rather than treatment per se. Because I believe that there's a lot of, uh, there's a lack of emphasis on the prevention of uh, this entity. Uh, but once it is there, the treatment needs to be holistic. Uh, not only we treat the pain, but the cause of the pain as well. But we need to go beyond that and address the impairments in the lame, uh, including the neurological problems as well as the functional problems as well. Given that hemiplegic shoulder pain is actually uh, an outcome of a neurological problem, which is a stroke, there are many things which are associated with pain like spasticity, uh, loss of dexterity, weakness, uh, proprioceptive deficits, and so on and so forth. So not to stop here, but also go beyond the pain, beyond the activity and limitations, and treat the person. So um, in one patient, the goal of treating the hemiplegic shoulder pain would be to have a comfortable sleep, whereas in the other patient, it would be, let's say, to help with the dressing with the upper body or uh, you know, help with driving. So it has to be uh, goal-oriented. So having said that, Post-stroke hemiplegic shoulder pain does not occur in isolation. The prevalence is ranging around between 16 to 84 percent. Uh, not only that, 90 percent of the patients have weakness, 30 percent have spasticity, half of them have fatigue and sensory impairment, and nearly half of them develop some sort of contractures across different joints around six months. So since post-stroke hemiplegic shoulder pain does not occur in isolation, we need to consider factors other than pain in the treatment of hemiplegic shoulder pain. And one of the classic models in the rehabilitation world, as you know of, is the International Classification of Functional Disability Model, ICF model, where the body structure and function where the pain is, is not, the treatment is not limited to this aspect. We need to identify, you know, how the pain interacts with different activities and how does it roll on into participation of that individual? What are the contextual factors, personal factors, and environmental factors that come into play? A classic example of having a shoulder pain is that not only consider the shoulder pain, but also look at the fitness level, trunk control, overhead activities, abilities, and quality of life parameters, in addition to environmental factors and personal factors. So having said that, we don't need to focus only on uh, identifying the three aspects of pain, but also to measure those aspects on three different zones, as in body function activities and participation, there's a bulk of literature available out there, the bulk of tools available out there. And I would just like to familiarize the audience with a few tools as uh, we go on. Uh, we're going to review some of the trials that have been done. They have reviewed some of the tools over here. So uh, going with a the theme of uh, the conference, you know, hemiplegic shoulder pain, what has been going on over the last five years. Uh, what I conducted uh, using these keywords, I figured out that there are 20 uh, almost clinical trials and randomized control trials uh, were done over the last five years from 2016 to 2020. Four were on kinesio taping, uh, two were on neuromuscular stimulation, two are peripheral neuromuscular stimu uh, stimulation, three on robotic therapy, one on orthotics and wheelchair, one on pulse radio frequency and uh, one on transcranial magnetic stimulation, uh, one on two on hyaluronic acid actually, and one on paraffin therapy. So having said that, that does not mean that similar research has not been done before. It just 
tells us is what's new, what are the recent trends in research over the last five years. So I'm going to briefly review them um, and see how they are actually taken up by uh, a couple of guidelines. So speaking of kinesio taping, uh, there was one trial which was done back in Taiwan in uh, 2016 in which therapeutic kinesio taping was studied against the uh, sham kinesio taping in 44 patients into two groups. And uh, the outcomes were pain, spasticity, a Fugelmeyer for upper limb modified bottle index and uh, uh, stroke specific quality of life. So there were significant improvements in the therapeutic kinesio taping. Similarly, another trial was done by the, sim uh, by the same principal investigator. Uh, in this, they used different outcome measures like pneumatic rating scale, disability index, and brain free rate of motion. Though the results were not significant, but they noticed the greater reductions of pain, disability index, pain free range of motion in the therapeutic kinesio taping. Um, a trial was done in China in 2018, published in 2018. Uh, in which kinesio therapy was uh, compared with the control group, and they also found favorable outcome in terms of pain intensity, subluxation, and range of motion with the muscle activity. In Spain, they did something different. They had three different groups. All of them received conventional therapy. One group received conventional therapy with kinesio taping. Uh, one group received kind of conventional therapy with neuromuscular stimulation, and the control group only received conventional therapy. Interestingly, they did not find any therapy superior to another in prevention of the hemiplegic shoulder pain. So let us review like how does it reflect on the guidelines. So the HA guidelines, which were published in 2016, they conclude that there's insufficient evidence to support or refute the efficacy of taping in the prevention of the hemiplegic shoulder pain. So it appears that they are a bit quiet in terms of uh, you know, therapeutic efficacy of the uh, taping. However, the Canadian guidelines have concluded that taping may be effective for improving hemiplegic shoulder pain, and, but it may not be effective for the motor function or um, control. Moving on to robotics, uh, I identified uh, three trials were done in robotics. So one of the first trial was done in Korea, in which this uh, robot was used against uh, measuring with conventional physical therapy done over four weeks. Outcomes were visual analog scale, pain-free range of motion, shoulder disability questionnaire as well, and they noticed significant improvements in outcomes with robotic uh, group of patients. Um, another study was done. Uh, it was in Cuba, 16 patients randomized for robotic versus conventional treatment. And robotic treatment improves subluxation, pain, spasticity, tone, as well as muscle strength. There was an interesting study with the monkey chair and band exercise system. It was more of a mechanical rather than electronic system. It was done in Korea, divided into two groups with the device system and conventional therapy carried out over 12 weeks. The outcomes were rate of motion and pain and visual analog scale and the strength. And again, a significant improvements were there in rate of motion and strength. Though the pain improvement was not statistically significant, there was some improvement in the hemiplegic shoulder pain in the experimental group. Uh, so coming back, again, AHA guidelines from 2016, they do not comment on uh, the use of robotic therapy on hemiplegic shoulder pain per se, but they appear to provide some, uh, they conclude that the robotic therapy appear to provide some benefit for uh, motor abilities and participation. So robotic therapy is something that has been growing pretty quick and pretty fast in the rehabilitation world, uh, especially more emphasis on gait training, um, hemiplegic, uh, pain, hemiplegic shoulder pain, but upper motor recovery is one of the greatest challenges in stroke. And there's a lot of emphasis on robotic uh, rehab. Um, Canadian guidelines, uh, they concluded that robotics may be beneficial for hemiplegic shoulder pain as well, as well as the uh, uh, range of motion and activities of daily living. So coming to electric stimulation, there were a few studies of muscle stimulation and one on peripheral nerve stimulation as well. There was a head-to-head -head trial between neuromuscular stimulation and TENS. Um, the outcome measures were pneumatic rating scale, fugal mire, range of motion, modified Ashworth scale, bath index, quality of life, strokes stroke specific quality of life. Uh, both the patient groups, they had improvement in hemiplegic shoulder pain, but neuromuscular electric stimulation was superior that of TENS and long-term analgesia. 
And a similar uh, outcomes were noted in another head-to-head trial between neuromuscular electric stimulation and TENS as well, uh, which identified, we used different scale like face rating scale and brief pain inventory, but they identified that neuromuscular electric stimulation was better and long-lasting effects than TENS. So both of the studies favored neuromuscular stimulation. So coming to peripheral nerve stimulation, this is an interesting area to explore. Though there have not been a lot of studies done on peripheral nerve stimulation, especially in context of a hemiplegic shoulder pain, this study specifically took a single lead, a single lead needle to stimulate uh, axillary nerve uh, via the intramuscular approach uh, using a true deltoid. That was done in Canada, and uh, it was uh, randomized between um, uh, uh, peripheral nerve stimulation group versus conventional physical therapy with these outcome measures. And uh, both groups improved significantly in outcomes, but uh, PNS was not superior to conventional physiotherapy. And uh, But I haven't come across any literature where uh, electrode implant techniques uh, in the shoulder were used for axillary nerve or suprascapular nerve. Uh, maybe one of the experts today can um, you know, enlighten on this aspect if they have experience or they on a, or the know of. Uh, so coming to uh, electric stimulation in the guidelines, uh, the AHA guidelines uh, conclude, actually both of the guidelines, they, they consider that neuromuscular stimulation uh, may be considered and they may, may be beneficial. However, the Canadian guidelines, they have mixed results regarding tense and invasive peripheral nerve stimulation for shoulder. Uh, so use of sling uh, was carried out in a Belgian study in the randomized control trial. Uh, they were actually three groups, two experimental groups. As you can see, the active move sling on the left side, and then we have the shoulder lift, which is a figure two, the middle one. And then the third one was without uh, shoulder sling. So they found out some interesting findings that the active move group reported more pain. The figure one uh, use of sling actually caused more pain. An interesting finding in this study was the wearing sling does not prevent pain or subluxation. However, uh, you know, patients without sling improved subluxation as well. So if sling is required, they concluded to prefer a shoulder lift, which is the middle uh, picture, as you can see over here, over the left active move sling, as is seen in the figure. Uh, so coming to the guidelines, the AC guidelines recommended that it is reasonable to consider uh, slings for shoulder subduxation, while the Canadian guidelines don't seem to be very convinced regarding the use of slings. Uh, however, they have uh, recommended or they have concluded that uh, a functional orthosis uh, may be beneficial for shoulder hemiplegia, as in seen in this diagram over here. So the use of uh, rest arm armrest in wheelchairs. Uh, there was a randomized control trial done in uh, 120 patients with a modified armrest versus, uh, you know, routine traditional armrest. They have not shared the pictures. I'm not being able to share exactly what kind of armrest they use. Uh, these were the outcome measures and the experimental group, as in the modified armrest that they devised. They improved all outcomes, but was not superior to the traditional wheelchair arm support for improving pain. Um, so this is the recommendation device from the similar study, which is re recommended in the Canadian guidelines, uh, that they may not modify arm breast may not have a superior approach, superior outcomes as compared to a traditional arm breast. AHA guidelines that recommend uh, lap raise and arm thrust might be useful positioning devices, devices to reduce shoulder pain and subluxation. It is a standard of practice um, in, in, in stroke rehab. Uh, pulse radio frequency uh, was uh, with on suprascapular nerve was uh, compared with a suprascapular nerve block with lidocaine on 30 patients randomized, and both groups received conventional therapies with the following outcomes at one and three months. Uh, and the pulse radio frequency on suprascapular nerve was found to be superior to the suprascapular nerve block. Uh, both the guidelines, the AHA guidelines and the Canadian guidelines, they do not comment on the pulse radio frequency, probably because of the scarcity of the literature. Uh, but suprascapular nerve block may be considered as an adjunct treatment for the hemiplegic total pain. <clears throat> So coming to a repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, there was uh, another um, a randomized control trial done between a repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation as well as uh, sham stimulation. Uh, the study was carried out in Korea. 
It was uh, the outcomes measured at four weeks with the following outcome measures. And RTMS uh, had more pain decreased by 25%, whereas the sham stimulation uh, did not give any significant change in pain. Uh, AHA guidelines do not comment on the use of RTMS specifically for the hemiptytic shoulder pain, uh, but they recommend that the results are not consistently beneficial for upper limb rehabilitation, though it is one of the upcoming and uh, you know um, advanced uh, contemporary uh, tools that are commonly that are more and more used in different modalities other than motor recovery. Uh, the Canadian guidelines concluded that there's likely beneficial for reducing pain in hemiplegia shoulder, but not for improving motor function or uh, range of motion or muscle strength. Uh, Perifin therapy was considered uh, compared with the placebo therapy uh, in one of the studies, randomized controlled trials done in China. Uh, it, the main outcome here was spasticity, but they also evaluated the, uh, the pain on visual analog scale. Initially, there was no improvement. However, the visual analog scale decreased over time. They report um, convincing results in the tr uh, an improvement of modified Ashworth scale in terms of spasticity. Both the guidelines, the Asia guidelines and the Canadian guidelines, they, they don't have any comment. Uh, they're not inclusive so far on paraffin treatment. Um, interesting studies were done on the use of hyaluronic acid, which are conventionally carried out in uh, intra-articular. Uh, but this uh, study from Taiwan, uh, there was a randomized control trial in which uh, normal saline was injected in nine controls and subacromial root was considered in hyaluronic acid. And they measured the pain on visual analog scale and they identified the sonographic changes in biceps and subscapularis. Uh, the visual analog scale and pain significantly improved up to 12 weeks with hyaluronic acid and they found uh, improvements, radiological improvements in the pathological uh, focus too. Uh, the same principal investigator and uh, team members had done something similar uh, as a pilot study in 2016 before they actually done the study on uh, in, in 2018. So uh, in summary for what we have reviewed over the last five years, what are the trends? Uh, what's new in the hemiplectic shoulder pain? As you know, this is a complex topic. It is a very vast topic to cover. But since the theme was just to focus on something new, just to get us familiar with what's happening in the world, so I chose to briefly review some of the literature and evidence. However, uh, literature is still very limited in terms of hemiplectic shoulder pain treatment. Um, there is lack of standardization and reliability. I believe that because uh, most of the research, as you may have seen, is more pain-focused rather than etiological focus. And given the complexities that it's not only the mechanical or you know, motor control uh, deficits which are there, there is a soft tissue lesion and there are neural components to that. It is very uh, difficult to generalize the same kind of treatment for all these uh, you know, disease in, uh, groups. Uh, without actually having to identify uh, exact etiology. Um, and it is rare, I would say, from a clinical practice to come up with one single etiology as a cause of the hemiplegic shoulder pain because uh, uh, there are more than one factors almost always involved. Um, so it's hard to standardize one kind of treatment for the pain itself without having to know exactly what are the underlying etiologies. As uh, we saw that most of the trials are smaller number, I would say the maximum was probably around 160 on one of the trials. The rest of the other trials were probably fewer in number, ranging from 15 to uh, 60s, um, so which is hard to conclude and come up with a definite evidence uh, in terms of strength, class, and living. So recent research trends are in on taping, electric stimulation, and robotics. Uh, there is further research required in robotics, uh, magnetic stimulation, and neuromodulation. modulation. There are, I guess, the, the upcoming fields which uh, need to be uh, further explored. And there's a lot of emphasis on that too. If I would have to make like two recommendations beyond this uh, review of the recent um, 
updates on hemiplegic shoulder pain, I would still want to say that, uh, you know, prevention of hemiplegic shoulder pain is uh, less emphasized in the literature and the practice as well, which needs to be more and more emphasized in practice and theory. So this is, I was speaking to a few of the colleagues back in, uh, in Australia and at their facility, their prevalence of hemiplegic shoulder pain post-stroke was very less. And they attributed to early intervention and active intervention as well, uh, which is uh, pretty reassuring and um, that it can be carried out in other population and other health systems. Obviously, this is not something which can be carried out by an individual or one pain physician uh, you know, family patient himself or herself, family has an integral role. Uh, if it an admitted patient, the nursing is on, a, is on the top line. And then uh, all the other clinicians uh, come into play. Um, well, the other thing is the treatment of hemiplegic shoulder pain can be more focused on etiology rather than uh, more uh, pain focused. And that's pretty much it. Thank you. Great. That's great. Thank you very much. That was very good. Very good uh, uh, talk, actually. Mm -hmm. I've yeah. taken. You've done a recent kind of research and give us an uh, give us an update. And as I said, that there are new upcoming kind of uh, uh, therapies, uh, especially if you talk about the peripheral neuro neuromodulation. Uh, so I last year I visited uh, a friend of mine in New York in my, Mount Sinai, but they do peripheral neuromodulation of uh, suprascapular nerve and axillary nerve. Uh, to reduce the shoulder pain. I think the way it works is because they use a motor stimulation. So when you actually have a contraction of the deltoid, you pull the shoulder back in place. So that's how you reduce the kind of, you know, the, the dragging sensation of the shoulder. So I think, you know, it's, it's an upcoming field. And I think uh, peripheral neurostimulation is something that's quite of new, but it will need some time to collect the data and uh, we, we will, I'm sure we will be in the next few years, we'll have a good amount of data to actually back that treatment up. Okay, so we will have a question and answer session after the talk of- uh, After the second talk, yes. Project, yeah, so uh, Amr, do you want yeah. to sort of introduce Abdullah and then we'll go on to the next talk. Yes, so I'm gonna uh, hand over to Dr. Abdullah Farabsi, who's um, basically from, from Jormundon, but uh, he's now adopted by the Taiwanese group. He's, he is working in Taiwan, Taipei uh, for one more full year. So his second year, he's starting his second year there as a fellowship. And um, he's our representative in the Northern countries like Ukraine, Russia, where he did his uh, medical school. So we have connections up in the North and in the East in Taiwan. Dr. Abdullah is gonna talk about joint innervation of the shoulder and uh, how to uh, deal with these um, shoulder pain. Dr. Abdullah, please. Okay, so Abdullah, if you want to share your screen. Sure. Good. Abdullah, I've already made your co-host, so you should be able to share your screen. Okay. All right, let me make you a co-host again, I think. Yep, here you go, you're a co-host now. Do you see my picture, uh, my slides? Not yet, you need Not to yet. share the screen. Okay. Green button down and then- Yeah, yeah, I am sharing. Unshare, unshare. Stop sharing and then share again. Sorry, I have uh, something problem with internet, I think. Right, whilst you are doing that, Amr, we will just ask the people to put the uh, kind of questions in the chat box. So if they have any questions, they can put in the chat box for the yeah. first talk, and then we'll this, move on yeah. to the second talk. Okay, and uh, so I think I've, I've gone through Abdullah's talk and actually he's got a very good picture. Yes, so I'm ready now. And You're ready? Perfect. Okay, share your screen, Abdullah. Yep, yep. you can see your screen. Okay. Fantastic. Great. Go ahead. Very good. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Amar. Thank you, Dr. Sadiq, for introducing me. 
Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, shoulder joint denervation, what's new. I will not focus uh, too much for uh, recent about uh, articles, because many thanks for Dr. Ahmed. He mentioned many of articles recently published. I will more focus on uh, clinical ones. So... Oh, I am uh, glad. I'm, it's my pleasure to be uh, a faculty on a great uh, pain school. One uh, golf pain school. It's one of the best pain school in the world, and it's the best in the Middle East. Uh, so thank you very much for the, this uh, pain school, Doctor Ammar and Doctor Sadiq, to create that this uh, pain school to teach a lot of anesthesiologists, PMR doctors radiologists, uh, pain physicians from all around the world. So um, to, I will talking about uh, objectives, neuroanatomy of shoulder joints. I will not focus on anatomy for shoulder joint because we will talk just about denervation of that joint. So I will focus just uh, on neuroanatomy, triple uh, nerve uh, blocks, suprascapular nerve, axillary nerve, lateral pectoral nerve, Solar anatomy and ultrasound guided injections, fluoroscopy guided injections as a, a hybrid technique, uh, and uh, and as uh, uh, radio frequency denervation evidence support the triple nerve block. So what Hilton's uh, Hilton's law said. Uh, in uh, 1863, that's often a nerve will supply both the muscles and skin relating to a particle joint. So we have uh, brachial plexus, as we know, shoulder pain. It could be intra-articular uh, and could be radicular dermatoma from cervical spine from brachial plexus. So we have here uh, in the picture, we, we see the brachial plexus. Uh, is like a tree. It contains uh, roots, trunk, uh, uh, and the terminal branch C5, C6, C7, A, C8, T1. Uh, so we will focus today on C5, C6 as superior trunk for uh, uh, suprascapular nerve and for uh, axillary nerve. And uh, the lateral pectoral nerve, it comes from C7 to C7, uh, C5 to C7. So, I, I would like to show this uh, video. It's, uh, it's uh, done by a talented doctor from uh, Taiwan. She is a PMR resident. Uh, it was uh, in the neuromuscular ultrasound in Taiwan one week ago. Uh, that's organized by, by Professor Kevin and Professor Chi Pink. So, we show here ultrasound, and this is the brachial plexus. C5, C6, C7, it's all precure plexus. It's a nice animation. So uh, starting with suprascapular nerve, supra, uh, suprascap what is suprascapular nerve? This suprascapular is coming from, it's uh, branching from uh, C5, C6, uh, and it's go posteriorly, inferiorly, and go to, uh, uh, to uh, underneath the suprascapular uh, ligament and then go to sub, uh, suprascapular, uh, supra, uh, subglenoid notch. And so suprascapular uh, nerve, it's uh, coming as we said, C5-6 superior trunk, and he has like motor innervation and sensory uh, motor innervation, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, Sensory, it uh, covers seventy percent of shoulder, uh, as we see, as we see here, the uh, suprascapular nerve. It comes with beneath the uh, suprascapular ligament and at uh, suprasca uh, supraspinatus fossa, and then uh, leaves the supraspinatus uh, fossa to uh, spinoglenoid notch under the. Uh, correct reclaiming ligaments. Uh, I think it's an event uh, sensory to posterior joint capsule, acromioclavicular joint, coracoclavicular ligament, and subacromial persa. This is the pathway of uh, suprascapular nerve. 
as you said, uh, the supraskabrine supply the superior and posterior shoulder, subacromial piercers, acromial clavicular joints, no innervation to the anterior and inferior shoulder, uh, and anterior shoulder joint capsules uh, discovered by subscapular, axillary, and lateral pectoral nerve. So, uh, uh, suprascapular nerve it covers um, uh, supraspinatus and infraspinatus. Uh, suprascapular nerve uh, block indications it's adhesive capsulitis, inflammatory arthritis, degenerative osteoarthritis, rotator cuff syndrome, hemiplegic shoulder pain, trauma, post-operative pain in arthros arthroscopic surgery, non-specific chronic uh, shoulder pain. So we have a lot of indications, advantages for, uh, from suprascapular nerve block. So also for diagnosis and treatment, uh, some uh, shoulder pain, uh, intervention local injection with anesthetic alone or with a combination with steroid or as uh, de denervation radiofrequency ablation. Technique blind, we have blind technique with surface anatomy, nerve stimulation guided, fluoroscopy guided, CT guided, ultrasound guided. So as we like to do ultrasound guided as growing up and uh, we prevent neurovascular uh, bundle uh, puncture. So it's better to use uh, combined ultrasound fluoroscopy to prevent any complications. Uh, side effects could be pneumothorax. It's a very dangerous and important side effects. Neurovascular trauma, headache, nausea, focal swelling. Most of the side effects are temporary, no obvious weakness of supraspinatus and infraspinatus mm -hmm. was reported. Long-term analgesic effect was variable. The procedure is suitable as an analgesic. Uh, if we go, uh, we, if we trace uh, the suprascapular nerve, we have uh, to trace it from a superior uh, trunk from uh, of precalipexus and distally inferior laterally until the probe, uh, until the probe above the distal clavicle and over the uh, trapezius muscle. It's uh, for uh, anterior supraspinatus uh, approach. Uh, and this is, we see here, uh, superior trunk and the tres of superior uh, suprascapular nerve. And this here, if we go distally and distally inferior laterally, we see the superior scapular nerve as uh, around, uh, uh, as monofocal, uh, hypoechoic, uh, oh, uh, it's dark. Uh, uh, in cervical region, we see the nerves as like dark dots. Uh, so, uh, super, uh, super uh, scapular uh, block we can do in three uh, approaches: supraclavicular approach, its proximal approach; suprascapular notch, its direct approach; supraspinatus fossa, indirect. So, uh, for supraclavicular approach, more superficial, better identified with ultrasound. Its landmark omohyoid muscle, as we say. Uh, suprascapular notch direct suprascapular uh, entrapment syndrome, bony landmark also, supraspinatus fossa and direct between suprascapular and spinoglenoid notch is in the suprascapular canal. So this is sub, uh, suprascapular uh, nerve uh, at supraspinous fossa. Uh, this we see the uh, probe position and the suprasbinous fossa. Here we see the supraspinatus muscle as uh, spinoglin uh, supraspinatus notch. And this is the, uh, another approach, uh, suprascapular nerve at uh, spinoglinoid notch. As we see here, the, it's for spinoglinoid notch, it's infraspinatus muscle, as this is the notch, and the suprascapular nerve inside the notch. So this article, it's uh, published in uh, um, 2020 in August. It's by Azat Aridwan. Uh, it is about suprascapular canine anatomical and topographical description and its clinical implication in entrapment syndrome. So if we suspect any suprascapular entrapment, we have to trace and uh, check the suprascapular nerve, as we said, from the precarious plexus, from up to down. So from the source, from, from the root, from C5-6. And uh, this is the canal. Uh, 
this is the entrance uh, of suprascapular nerve below uh, b- beneath the uh, suprascapular ligament and this is the canal uh, the length of the canal it's about uh, 25 plus minus 3 and the width of the canal it's about 13 plus minus 3 millimeter of course and this is the uh, exit of uh, suprascapular nerve it's from a uh, spinoglinoid notch as we know the suprascapular nerve it's uh, it become uh, it, as let we see here uh, it's where it will connect with the artery the nerve uh, suprascapular nerve and artery and vein it go together and connected together under the in the spinoglinoid notch and the, the ligament and when it's uh, in supraspinous fossa and the, uh, the nerve it will be uh, go under the suprascapular ligament and the artery and the vein go above the ligament and they connect it together in spinoglinoid notch when supra, suprascapular nerve leave the uh, suprascapular uh, supraspinatus uh, muscle so suprascapular canal potential at an anatomical entrapment sites. Uh, so we have multi sites we could expect mm-hmm. to be uh, to be uh, entrapped. Pre entrance sites is due to, due to chronic heavy loads or shoulder dystonia, soft tissue impingement due to tumors or variant high margin of the subscapularis muscle, scar tissue adhesions. Entrance it could uh, it could be uh, the cause from decreased suprascapular notch sp- uh, space capacity, dynamic compression, vascular compression, and in the passage in the middle of the canal, it uh, could be from the fiber adhesions of the fascia, suprascapular nerve traction, dynamic compression, compression, also vascular compression. And the exit from uh, this infra, uh, from supraspinatus fossa and the, from the canal, it's uh, the cause could be space occupying pathology like uh, can- gangliosinovial cyst, dynamic compression, uh, and spinoglinoid ligament t- uh, tension. Uh, post exits after the suprascapular nerve uh, exists from uh, the, the canal, the entrapment could be uh, due to traction like rotator cuff muscle tear or direct chronic compression like irreducibleness in, in hospitalized patients. So uh, always when we suspect, as we said, the uh, nerve entrapment, we have to trace, uh, check the nerve from the source to exit. Uh, Injection uh, technique and plan coronal approach, as we see, uh, we palpate the scapula. We have uh, up three approaches. I will talk about uh, supraspinatus uh, fossa approach. We put just uh, we palpate the spine, uh, scapula spine, and we put the probe uh, parallel and above the scapula spine, and to, we will see the scapula and uh, as a hyperechoic line, continuous hyperechoic line. Then we go a uh, cephalid and. Uh, Cephalid and lateral to see until we see uh, U, uh, like U letter, we see the spino as uh, uh, suprascapular notch. Uh, the patient position should be set the patient with the arm in lab. Uh, probe position, probe place, as we said, uh, parallel to sc- scapular spine. Uh, this is the needle direction. The needle is directed from the uh, lateral side of the probe implant toward the nerve sheath. This is uh, suprascapular. Uh, sh- uh, sh- this is the sheath. Suprascapular notch is, contains the nerve, as we said, and the uh, uh, artery. And we, so we have to be careful when we insert the line. Uh, some physicians prefer to do in uh, out of plane approach directly uh, to the to the nerve, but we have to be careful because uh, to avoid any uh, pneumothorax because the line and pleural is here below. Uh, below. Uh, and uh, some physicians like to do in plane, middle to lateral or lateral to middle. Anyway, you have to use ultrasound uh, to, be pre- to prevent uh, and see uh, any complications of pneumothorax and to see the trajectory of the needle. So this is the local anesthesia spread uh, uh, for for, uh, 
after we did the injection in the sheath, we see the expanded of the sheath. This is a suprascapular nerves. This is suprascapular ligament, transverse scapular ligament. This is the needle tip here we done from medial to lateral. This is the supraspinatus muscle. This is fluoroscopy guided. Uh, like as we see, so to also superspinous uh, fossa. This is uh, a contrast and the needle, radio frequency needle. So this is the needle tip inside the uh, notch, and this is after we give the contrast spread. So uh, what we had precapillaries and equipment demonstrate the spread of the injected around the nerve. It's very important. And the uh, equipment's 22 uh, to 25 uh, gauge, 3 or 3.5 needle, 0.5 ml of steroid preparation, typically 40 milligram of uh, steroid, ramsinol or methylprednisolone. Actually, if, I, if there is severe inflammation, we can uh, increase uh, the steroid for uh, 80 milligram first time, then uh, substantially we give uh, 40 milligram. For um, L of local anesthesia, total volume we can give like uh, 10, 12 uh, ml, safety consideration, the need that should be visualized, avoid pneumothorax. This uh, article is done by, in Taiwan from uh, Professor Kevin Chang and Professor uh, uh, Chi Lin and uh, about sonographic nerve tracking in the cervical region. It is, uh, was published in 2016. And uh, here we uh, see the suprascapular tracking from its uh, in cervical region. So the suprascapular nerves, with, as we see yellow arrow here, this is the suprascapular nerve. If we go distally, laterally, inferior, uh, along with suprascapular pathway, ne suprascapular nerve pathway. So this article is uh, published uh, in 2016 also by also by uh, Professor Kevin Chang and Professor Chi Ping, uh, Dr. Uh, Wei Tang. It's a comparison of the effectiveness of suprascapular nerve block with physical therapy placebo and also compare with the intraarticular injection in the management of chronic shoulder pain. And uh, this, uh, in conclusion, this uh, uh, article uh, results like uh, the suprascapular nerve block has a superiority for, uh, of, uh, for the physical therapy and placebo alone. If we compare with intraarticular injection, uh, it's the same effect. But for me, uh, I, can, I like to do a suprascapular nerve block than uh, inject steroid in the uh, inside the joint or uh, inside the joint. So radio frequency denervation of suprascapular nerve uh, indications and evidences. I will not talk about uh, articles because Dr. Ahmed, he also, he already mentioned about that. This is the trajectory of uh, uh, radio frequency needle as we see uh, directly to suprascapular nerve. Uh, this article is also done by Professor Kevin and Professor Chief England, Professor Swan. It's ultrasound guided proximal suprascapular nerve block with radio frequency regioning for patients with malignancy associated with calcium trans shoulder pain. It's also uh, in result uh, showed like uh, the superiority of radio frequency ablation to the, sim uh, uh, the only just uh, suprascapular nerve. So this is the uh, infloroscopy guided. As we see the uh, radio frequency needed, the suprascapular notch, right suprascapular notch. So now I will talk, uh, I will move to another uh, nerve, it's axillary nerve. Uh, again, we refer to uh, Brachial plexus, axillary nerve, it's also come from a posterior cord coming from C5, C6. Uh, axillary nerve, it's become uh, between the uh, um, uh, subscapularis muscle and the uh, teres muscle. It's uh, and hanging up with the humerus and to uh, 
uh, from posterior cord of brachioplexus. It's an red uh, deltoid uh, muscle, uh, uh, anterior and uh, middle part of uh, portion of uh, deltoid muscle, teres minor, long head of triceps, sensory inferior air joint capsule, cutaneous innervation of inferior deltoid area. So how to perform ultrasound for axillary nerve block? Uh, we have also three approaches. Uh, we have uh, the pro classical approach in the axillary region. I will just, uh, and another approach, it's uh, uh, what will I focus now from posterior side. Uh, it's uh, for, uh, lateral from uh, humeral uh, shaft uh, and uh, uh, and now uh, this is the position of the probe as we see from lateral from the axillary nerve we see uh, the uh, the probe it should be in coronal so we have to see the posterior uh, uh, posterior uh, humeral uh, artery circumflex humeral artery uh, and to avoid uh, this that's why we have to check the, where is the artery uh, using Doppler ultrasound, then we do an injection. So the technique is a uh, proposition parallel to the humerus and uh, uh, parallel to humerus shaft, two centimeters below acromium, as we said here, uh, identify the uh, humerus shaft, move medially until humerus disappears. Uh, and uh, then slightly lateral until the humerus just reappear. This is the uh, so to, uh, this is the humeral shaft. This is uh, the axillary nerve. This is posterior uh, circumflex, circumflex uh, humeral artery. It's near the nerve as we see here. As the nerve, it's hyperechoic, not like in cervical region, a uh, dark uh, dot. Abdullah, are you there? I can see it. Yes, yes, please. Okay. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I don't know today what's the problem with internet. Not to worry. Just uh, see whether you can skip on to the next slide because I can see your slides, not a problem. Because you're near to your presentation anyway, aren't you? Because you've got a few more slides and then You see now, still yeah, see my... Yeah, all good. Thank you. That's great. So, uh, also, this is the... Uh, uh, we back to uh, axillary nerve. This is the... We measure here the distance from the skin to the axillary nerve. Uh, as we see here, the posterior circumflex uh, uh, humeral artery and the, how the axillary nerve is nearby the artery. And this is the humerus and medial border of the humerus. And this is the deltoid muscle. Uh, so we go posterior to and the injections, posterior uh, uh, to anterior in plain approach. So advantages of suprascapular nerve uh, and axillary nerve block together, if we want to do together. Less phrenic nerve blocked, if, uh, a voice motor block of entire arm, injection distance from C5-6 roots and uh, left uh, thoracic nerve, uh, dorsal scapular nerve, reduced three-pound pain effect of uh, interscalium plexus block. Uh, make it slide two, uh, Abdullah, make it slide two. Okay, sorry. Uh, reduced three-pound yes. pain effect of interscalium uh, block, analgesic effect, uh, appear prolonged. So a uh, smaller pneumothorax uh, risk if we, compa uh, if we compare with interscalium plexus block. Uh, complications of suprascopular nerve and axillary nerve block, peripheral nerve injury, intravascular injection, concurrent dreaded nerve blockage. It's uh, especially for axillary nerve block. Pneumothorax uh, more especially for suprascopular nerve block. Uh, this is the last uh, nerve, uh, what we should uh, denervate for the shoulder joint, lateral pectoral nerve, 
Lateral pectoral nerve, uh, as we see uh, here, it's uh, coming from C5 to C7. So this is the lateral pectoral nerve. It's uh, coming up between uh, to be uh, in the uh, in the plane between the pectoralis minor and the pectoralis major. It's the the it's the plane. Whereas uh, we have here the uh, thoracoacromial artery, and we have also the lateral pectoral nerve. Uh, so this is the uh, this is the pectoralis major, pectoralis minor, and serratus anterior. Uh, this is from PIX uh, two as we uh, uh, as we do the injection between the pectoralis major and pectoralis minor. Also, we do do injection between the pectoralis minor and serratus anterior. And this uh, we have to avoid the pleura so always we have to check the pleura where to avoid uh, entering if we do in plane or a plane out of plane we have uh, oh sorry we have in plane we have to see the trajectory needle uh, by the ultrasound uh, then we do injection so we check here Doppler uh, to see the axillary and vein because it, uh, it's uh, close nearby the, uh, the pectoralis minor. It's lateral from uh, pectoralis minor. Uh, <clears throat> this proper position we see in plane approach this, uh, for uh, lateral pectoral nerve. So this is the tracing of uh, uh, ultrasound uh, medial to laterally, where, uh, and uh, this is the pectoralis major, pectoralis minor. This is the uh, yellow arrow shows the lateral pectoral nerve, and you see the lateral pectoral nerve. That uh, we should uh, give uh, when we inject, we should uh, give the injection and uh, uh, local incisions or steroid injection in uh, two different or three different sites in the plane. Uh, if we inject uh, and we uh, see the, uh, 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 the injection spread, it's not uh, transverse in the plane, it could be in the muscle. So we have to check the injection to be sure in the plane. So take home message, suprascapular nerve block is a safe technique to relieve uh, chronic shoulder pain and post-operative shoulder pain for advanced physiotherapy. Approach by surface anatomy accurately with the guidance of EMG, fluoroscopy, CT guy, uh, scan, ultrasonography. Pulse RF leaching of the triple nerves is effective for longer Uh, suprascapular or nerve block alone uh, if we compare with the uh, intraarticular injection so the superiority for pulse rate frequency lesioning with high resolution ultrasound physicians can easily scan the peripheral nerves on the upper extremity uh, check and neurovascular bundle before to prevent any complications don't rush to do any injection before you do check uh, for a uh, tracing check for, for the nerve from, the, from source of, uh, to the exit to see uh, if there is any entrapment or because shoulder pain, as we said, it could be many uh, differential diagnoses starting from a neurological, some cervical spine, plexus, uh, plexopathy in uh, sport medicine or uh, from thoracic outlet syndrome, uh, uh, syndrome pain syndrome, or could be intra-articular from tendons, intra-articular shoulder from tendons, from ligaments, from uh, the muscles around the shoulder. And this is my profile picture on Facebook. This is my phone, WhatsApp, email. Any questions you can ask? This is here, my hospital where I did fellowship in Taipei. And this is Petra in Jordan. You are welcome all. I invite you to come and visit Jordan, of course, after COVID-19. And thank you. Thank you, Abdullah. Uh, thank you, Abdullah. Yes. Great. Good okay. overview. I, I, am sorry. I am sorry for internet, but I could not do anything. No problem. No problem. It's fine. It's fine. So, Amar, we have a few questions here. So people yeah. have written a few questions yes. in the chat box. So, yes. chat box. So we have a question for Ahmed. Ahmed, are you there? So we have yes, a question yeah. here. Uh, yeah. Hemiplegic shoulder pain, how frequently we have to block suprascapular nerve and hyaluronic acid injection 
Uh, how many repeat doses are advisable? So what's your take on this? Well, uh, based on the literature for hyaluronic acid, what they did was uh, there were a couple of studies which I had mentioned. Uh, they did it subacromial, sub interestingly, and not intraarticular. That's number one. And the frequency was they did it three injections every week. Okay. And uh, coming to the suprascapular nerve block, uh, you know, again, I would go back to the same thing that, you know, we need to focus on the etiology exactly as to what we are treating over there. So if it's something, if the pain is likely attributed to uh, spasticity, and, uh, you know, that may not really help. So okay. when in conditions where there's a combined um, you know, etiologies as in, in terms of adhesive capsulitis, stutated cough, tendinopathy, and spasticity, that is when it, is, it can be considered. So um, it would be the last resort uh, for practical purposes. And again, uh, the, the priority is to focus on the etiology and not the pain. That's right. So that's great. So actually, uh, you answered both the questions. Now, one more question we have here is uh, in terms of the uh, uh, the question is for Abdullah, basically. So you, you described the triple block. Uh, what about the shoulder muscle weakness after triple block? Uh, yeah, so could be, could, could, as we said, uh, uh, as, as we said, suprascapular nerve, it's uh, cover motor uh, as motor supraspinatus and supraspinatus, but uh, they didn't, uh, uh, there is no case reports about any weakness after the infraspinatus or supraspinatus. I already mentioned in the lecture about this. Sure. Right. So uh, we have a question from uh, John Wilton. John is a great guy and he's been very supportive. So John is asking a question. Uh, is anyone treating lateral or distal branches of suprascapular nerve uh, and selective axillary nerve? So what's your take on it? So I can answer that question, but he's asking selective branches. So no, if I do, if I can do uh, like uh, axillary with the suprascapular or in combined with lateral pectoral. Lateral pectoral uh, for the shoulder that's more common uh, uh, supply or cover the axillary uh, region just alone. So we cannot do uh, selective. So if the if the pain it depends of the pain, if the pain has source from for example supraspinatus was uh, supras, uh, supraspinatus muscle or something and we did uh, injection uh, intramuscular uh, or uh, uh, intraarticular, and uh, we don't have any uh, any positive response. We can do suprascapular nerve uh, denervation uh, selective first. If we, uh, uh, but it's better to do combination. Right. So, uh, answer to your question, John. Uh, me, uh, I do I do selective suprascap and axillary nerve uh, conventional radio frequency. And I, th I think Amr, Amr does that too. Uh, and we are actually, it's a work in progress. We are nearly there, uh, but we, we have described technique uh, as a part of Gulf Pain School faculty uh, about uh, a cuff technique uh, for uh, suprascapular axillary nerve. Body closure. No. <laughs> <laughs> suprascapular <laughs> and axillary nerve denervation procedure <laughs> using ultrasound and x-rays. Uh, so we do do that. Uh, and a hybrid, hybrid technique. Hybrid yes. technique, yes. yes. Now we have one last question and then we'll move on to the next talk. So whilst uh, Abdullah gets his slides up, so Abdullah from Egypt. Uh, Egypt, Tanta. Like, if he gets his slides up. Uh, and so someone is asking how long do the three nerve or like triple nerve block for shoulder pain would work if you do pulse radio frequency treatment? So if we do, uh, it's uh, it will work uh, no, uh, six to one year, six months to one year if okay. we do RF okay. legioning. Okay. Right, six months to one year. Okay. And uh, question for you, Ahmed, last question here is about uh, the uh, spasticity. Uh, if, you, if you think this, there's a spasticity of the muscles, then can you treat that using Botox uh, or will that be counterproductive because you're going to make the weakness in the shoulder worse? What's your take on it? 
That has been an interesting question. That has been a matter of debate as well. At some of the hospitals, uh, there's usually a protocol that not to have injection treatments with botulinum toxin in the first three months because post strokes. The, the maximum neurological or motor recovery is expected to be within the first three months. Um, however, if it's progressive and it's intractable, uh, there's a margin to consider that early on. Uh, it also depends upon the severity of uh, the stroke and how much motor recovery is uh, there or how much motor recovery is expected or not. The motor recovery or the functional use of um, upper limb post-stroke chances are pretty bleak in majority of the patients. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the challenges that patients come across in terms of acceptance too. And there's a very brief window period where there's an intervention required. So um, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, usually it's almost always a combination um, of uh, two or three different uh, etiologies, underlying etiologies. Spasticity is often uh, one of them. And uh, botulinum toxin does play a role uh, in my experience. Uh, so we have to chalk out as to which one is the more oh. predominant, uh, you know, underlying or possible underlying etiology. Because mm -hmm. a patient who has kept his or her hand in a fixed, adducted, internally rotated position, you would have uh, imagined that there's uh, muscle atrophy, there's uh, fibrosis of the joint at the same time, on top of neural hypertonicity, which is, um, spasticity versus some intrinsic shortening of the muscles and contractures developing too. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so it's a, it's a it's very individualized. Though uh, botulinum toxin does play a role, but if you review the guidelines, the guidelines are pretty much mixed over here. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of there's some uh, reports stating that botulinum toxin will help overall pain. Mm -hmm. And it, this is one of the other messages that I would like to convey out there that, you know, once we are reviewing those uh, guidelines, which are just focusing on the pain without really emphasizing or elaborating what is the underlying diagnosis, okay. it's really yeah. hard to interpret. That. Right. I think, you know, and as you said, prevention is better than cure and trying to work on the cause for the pain is what we should focus on rather than just pain itself. Yes. Correct. Yeah. I would promote that. that. A very good take home message that you gave us. Right, guys. So we are going to now move from shoulder to knee. So we have had two back to back talks on shoulder. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for our speakers, uh, Dr. Hamid Qureshi uh, from Saudi Arabia and uh, Dr. Abdulal Karabshe from Taiwan. So thank you so much, guys. Right. So we're moving on to the next topic which is a knee pain. Uh, we come across this uh, in our day-to-day -day life. Our patients do have kind of, you know, chronic knee pain, secondary to osteoarthritis. And uh, we have an uh, excellent speaker from Egypt. Uh, <coughs> so Dr. Abdullah uh, Alam, uh, who is going to tell us about the physiatrist's uh, point of view on management of uh, chronic knee pain. Abdullah, stage yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sadek. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ammar, for giving me uh, such opportunity to uh, present state-of-art uh, uh, talk about uh, physiatrist strategies for treatment of osteoarthritis knee. Uh, my agenda, I uh, will talk about definition, risk factors, uh, lifestyle modification, rehabilitation, medical treatment, and local injections, and lastly, tips and tricks. Regarding definition, osteoarthritis is a disease of all joint structures. It affects the cartilage, bone, uh, synovium, and uh, the fibrocartilage. So there is no single drug that can target all these structures. Regarding risk factors, we have um, a modifiable risk factors like obesity and the local abnormal biomechanics. I will demonstrate later in my slides and non-modifiable risk factors like age six, which lead to cartilage loss, deformity, pain, and a vicious circle of gaining weight and vice versa. Regarding lifestyle modification, reduction of body weight will alleviate the systemic inflammatory cytokines released by adipose tissue and will help uh, reduction of uh, loss of cartilage also will reduce the axial forces across the medial tibiofemoral 
كومبارتمنت اند ريديوس ذا فيروس مال الاينمنت كومباينيشن اوف ريدكشن اوف بودي ويت لاترال ويدج انسولز اند انجكشن انتو ميديال تيبيو فيمورال كومبارتمنت ويل بروفايد ذا بيست تريتمنت ان سيتش بيشنتس اكوردنج تو ماي بيرسونال اكسبيرينس ريدكشن اوف بودي ويت ان فورم اوف لوس اوف 5 كيلوغرامز ويل ريديوس ذا فورس اون ذا ني باي 15 تو 13 كيلو with each step. Patients should use high heart chairs that require less effort to get in and out uh, with, without flexion of the knee more than 19 degrees. Uh, changes should be made to seat best going upstairs with uh, a healthy uh, leg or less affected leg and going down with a bad leg or more affected leg in bilateral osteoarthritis knee with using the uh, stairs support to help the weight Uh, lifting regarding the canes the uh, assistive walking device in such uh, meta-analysis showed that uh, there is uh, no consistent relationship between the use and or non-use of uh, assistive walking device and OMAC pain scores and the further studies are needed to confirm the relationship and the importance of use patients should avoid hard soles and high heels should be avoided avoid an even ground and rough ground uh, during walking regarding rehabilitation exercise therapy muscle mass is proportional to the medial tibial uh, cartilage volume it increases the interleukin 10 which is anti-inflammatory and Uh, control protective by the way exercise will stimulate immune cells or skeletal muscles to uh, release the brain derived neurotrophic factor which improves the pain and function in osteoarthritis knee and other chronic inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis and in this meta-analysis they concluded that the exercise significantly reduces pain and improve function and uh, quality of life in patients at short term eight weeks up to two months the effect is reduced slowly uh, further up at uh, nine and 18 months respectively in this uh, meta-analysis they uh, showed that aquatic exercise land-based exercise yoga uh, showed a small to high effect for improving pain and physical function quality of life and stiffness active exercise and sport are effective to improve pain and fun- physical function in elderly people with osteoarthritis lateral wedge in soles can improve the femorotibial angle medial tibial femoral angle together with reduction of body weight and injection at the medial tibial femoral compartment will improve significantly pain and function in this meta-analysis lateral wedge in soles can improve the femoral angle but no benefit regarding pain and function also regarding knee braces which uh, correct the malalignment and reduce the biomechanical load on the affected compartment and help the stability and increase the proprioception this meta-analysis showed that valgus bracing for median knee osteoarthritis result in small to moderate improvement of pain Regarding thermotherapy like hot back and cold back can help uh, patients in early cases in reduction of pain. Regarding electrostimulation, this meta-analysis said that electrostimulation, either electroanalgesic or uh, neurostimulation, uh, is safe, promising in elevating pain, but recommendation level is either uncertain or not appropriate. Regarding therapeutic ultrasound, the mechanism of action that deep heat generated from ultrasound therapy provides analgesia, reduces muscle spasm, increase the collagen extensibility and accelerate the metabolic processes needed for repair. Pain relief may occur as a result of activation of uh, uh, beta mechanoreceptors and A alpha fibers that inhibit the nociception and the C fiber pathway. Therapeutic ultrasound in this meta analysis uh, showed that uh, safe, effective treatment in improving pain and function in osteoarthritis uh, knee. Uh, Pulsed magnetic field therapy also uh, has an anti inflammatory re- and regenerative effect and the analgesic effects in patients with knee osteoarthritis and this meta-analysis showed that it elevates the pain and improve physical function in patients with knee and hand osteoarthritis uh, acupuncture in this meta-analysis can improve short and long-term physical function but only short-term pain relief 
regarding medical treatment non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs in this meta analysis published in Lancet 2017, no rule for single agent paracetamol for the treatment of patients with osteoarthritis irrespective of the dose. Diclofenac uh, 150 milligram per day is the most effective non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs with respect to adverse events and the choice according to uh, patient physician uh, interaction. Regarding glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate, this meta analysis shows that chondroitin sulfate is more effective than placebo on relieving pain and improving physical function, while glucosamine showed effect on stiffness outcome. Regarding local injections, intraarticular corticosteroid injection, this meta analysis showed that uh, corticosteroid injection is more beneficial than placebo and with respect of uh, to pain reduction and uh, functional improvement. The improvement is relatively short, less than six months. And regarding the deleterious effect on cartilage sickness, it should be used with caution, despite this study showed small uh, cartilage uh, loss on long period of follow-up with MRI. Regarding hyaluronic acid, it works with through visco supplementation, condor protection, relief of pain, and improvement of proprioception anti inflammatory effects. This meta analysis showed that hyaluronic acid is effective as an intervention in treatment of knee osteoarthritis without increased risk of adverse events of local injection. Comparing hyaluronic acid injections to oral non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, the comparing short outcomes of hyaluronic acid injection with oral NSAIDs for treatment of knee osteoarthritis, hyaluronic acid injections provided statistically significant but not clinically important improvement in knee pain and function along with a lower all, overall risk of adverse events in comparison to uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Comparing intraarticular hyaluronic acid to missile prednisolone, both hyaluronic acid and missile prednisolone injections were effective therapies for patients with knee osteoarthritis. Missile prednisolone showed comparable efficacy in reducing pain and improving functional recovery to hyaluronic acid, and no significant differences was found in long term follow up in terms of adverse events. Regarding platelet rich plasma, PRP is superior to hyaluronic acid for symptomatic knee pain at six and 12 months periods. According to this uh, meta analysis, uh, also patients undergoing treatment for knee osteoarthritis with PRP can be expected to experience improved clinical outcomes when compared with hyaluronic acid, and the leukocyte poor PRP is better than leukocyte rich uh, PRP. Interarticular articular toxin targets many neuropeptides leading to reduction of pain, reduction of peripheral and central sensitization. It reduces the neurogenic inflammation uh, having anti-inflammatory effect. And in this table, uh, me and Dr. Feliz Galicio uh, suppose a uh, body mass index based dose uh, regimen according to our experience for patients with knee osteoarthritis and in this meta-analysis botulinum toxin type a is effective and safe in painful knee or a treatment in both short term and long term period of follow-up uh, regarding genicular nerve block this uh, randomized controlled trial published in pain physician 2018 concluded that ultrasound guided genicular nerve block when combined with local anesthetic and corticosteroids provide short-term pain relief. However, the clinical benefit of corticosteroid administration was not clear in comparison with local anesthetic alone. Uh, my tips and the tricks is uh, to inject hyaluronic acid at sites of maximal uh, mechanical stress like medial tibiofemoral compartment and the lateral patellofemoral compartment. Uh, the second tip is not to inject in presence of synovitis. Hyaluronic acid is irritant and can induce acute arthritis. Don't inject in presence of a dilution, a fusion. Dilution of hyaluronic acid will occur and the hyaluronic disease in effusion will degrade the hyaluronic acid. And don't inject in background of crystal arthrosis. Uh, hyaluronic acid can precipitate acute attack of gout and pseudo gout. Also, don't inject platelet rich plasma in background of synovitis or effusion because BRP contains catabolic as well as anabolic mediators. And the injection in a background of inflammation will drive inflammation and destruction rather than repair. Also, don't inject BRP in presence of crystals. Uh, acute attack of uh, crystal arthrosis is reported in some. Case reports intraarticular corticosteroids uh, can be used for synovitis and effusions in three weeks later or more. You can inject intraarticular PRP.
IP, heme contaminated is not preferred because heme is controtoxic and don't inject local anesthetics with BRB in the same uh, setting unless you will do nerve block for the nerve supply. Uh, regarding the Land, uh, landmark based injections in comparison to imaging injections. This meta analysis shows that inject, uh, imaging based knee injections is uh, better than uh, landmark based injections 99% versus 79%. Also, regarding genicular nerve block fluoroscopy uh, or ultrasound guided, let us see the recommendation of eratum. That saying use of ionizing radiation is forbidden if the same diagnostic or therapeutic result can be achieved with a non radiant modality. So, ultrasound is better to do uh, the uh, genicular nerve block. In this uh, uh, photo, this is the uh, trajectory of my needle to place hyaluronic acid at the maximum site of stress, the lateral patellofemoral uh, compartment. And in this uh, video, you can see the needle and the gush of the fluid at the lateral patellofemoral compartment. It is not sufficient to inject hyaluronic acid in the uh, site of maximal stress. Also, you should use other modalities to improve the uh, results, like reduction of body weight, strengthening of vastus medialis oblique, and the use of uh, patellar tracking knee or sores. Also, in cases of uh, medial tibiofemoral osteocytes with subluxation or, dis or dislocation of medial meniscus, and the two kissing osteophytes, as we see, we can do uh, infrapatellar branch uh, block first, and then inject uh, hyaluronic acid uh, in the medial tibiofemoral compartment together with reduction of body weight and the use of lateral wedge in soul. This will optimize the uh, result and the response of the treatment. And this video demonstrates the injection into the medial tibiofemoral compartment of hyaluronic acid or combined hyaluronic acid and the BRB. A take home message multimodal approach and uh, reconsidering the uh, lifestyle modification together with the uh, medical treatment and uh, interventions available for physiatrists uh, will improve response and management of osteoarthritis uh, knee. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Abdullah. That's fantastic. I think it was a very good uh, overview of what you would do as a physiatrist and what kind of uh, treatment strategies you will focus on. Now, uh, we will take the question answers after the next talk. So, Amar, are you there? Can you share your screen? We'll go on to the next talk. And then after that, uh, we will, you know, uh, so yes. share your screen. There. Yeah. Can So, Dr. Amasalti from Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. Uh, so, he's going to talk to us about the uh, knee joint denervation, the anatomy, and then I'll talk on the practical approach uh, of uh, knee joint denervation. So, we divided the talk. So, it's a dual act. So, uh, Amr, next. Yeah, we like to do it uh, <laughs> together as a team. <laughs> right. Thank you as so much. Brilliant. So, we, we have 20 minutes. I have 10 minutes for anatomy. So I'm gonna go quick, uh, quickly uh, on that. So uh, just um, uh, as Sadiq said, I'm, I'm working in Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. We have a very nice view from uh, the, the air, air view on our hospital, uh, state of the art hospital where I have a very good uh, pain um, service. So uh, as you said, um, knee innervation and uh, um, is not uh, that something simple. Uh, so what do we know about it? We know that first it's complex. So um, we need to understand, we need to, to learn about it. We know that there are some old anatomical studies that show, that are showing, um, showing lots of um, uh, innervations and uh, images. Uh, there's a general agreement in the literature that the femoral sciatic obturator nerves um, are there, but no consensus on the number and origin of the nerves uh, supplying the knee capsule. So this is the complexity. It comes from here. We know there are three nerves bringing the, the whole supply, but the number and origin uh, are not uh, very uh, easy to find and no consensus on that. So this is a very interesting uh, paper from our friend, um, Philippe Peng, a great um, paper on uh, 
regional season pain medicine recently, where it shows really this network of, uh, of nerves. And Dr. Sadiq will be talking about the strip lesion when we talk about denervation. And we know that we have superior medial uh, genicular nerve, we have the superior lateral genicular nerve, and we have the inferior medial genicular nerve that needs to be um, denervated if we want to have a good um, efficacy. Despite that, we have, we're still having between 10 and 15% of failure because we don't deal with the posterior capsule. I'm going to show some examples why and how we can deal with that. So sensory invasion of the knee, we know that we have the femoral, we have sciatic and obturator nerves, but they are mixed nerve, sensory and motor nerve, and we don't want to have the motor nerve involved in the denervation. So we need to think about it. Another very interesting paper came from the Danish group, uh, Thomas uh, Binson and his group, showing that there's a spread when you do ultrasound guided injectate on the adductor canal, there's a spread uh, to the genicular branches of a posterior obturator nerve and the popliteal plexus. This is another um, interesting uh, paper on the spread to towards the popliteal plexus. So think about popliteal plexus, which is starting with when you scan, uh, going down the, the obturator and the um, adductor canal, you have the sartorius muscle, you have the saphenous nerve, and then branching the nerve to the vastus medialis muscle, where later it's going to become a genicular, superior genicular, media, superior medial genicular nerve. And then we have very nice uh, pictures and uh, illustration from our group, from Nysora group, showing that we have the nerves at the vastus lateralis, which is involving the superlateral genicular nerve. We have the nerve to vastus medialis, which is interest, interesting in the superomedial genicular nerve. There's a small nerve which is not really um, tackled by the denervation, and we don't know much about it. It's the recurrent fibular nerve from the common perineal nerve, also on the lateral side. But this is not a uh, region and target for any denervation because of the risk of, um, of uh, uh, lesioning this interesting and important uh, uh, recurrent fibular nerve. The important thing is that the capsule, the posterior capsule, should be tackled and should we think we need to think about it in order to reduce the failure rate. Another interesting anatomical finding and um, landmark is the arteries. When you do scanning, you see the arteries and you can find your genicular nerve more easily when you have uh, a good view of your, uh, of your um, arteries um, within the, uh, your view on the ultrasound. And then you have the anatomical dis dissection showing the, for example, in this case here, superomedial genicular nerve coming um, between the condyle, the condyle here, and the adductor magnus uh, tendon on the adductor tubercle here uh, going down. You need to, to trace it. And then you have the inferior medical, um, inferior um, medial genicular nerve, which comes horizontally, and this is an important point when you have this, this is the tendon and this is the nerve with the artery coming here, and this is the target where we need to, uh, to denervate. And this is the representation of the, of the, uh, in the ultrasound, showing that between the, the uh, condyle, the tendon, and the medic femoral medial epicondyle, then descends approximately one centimeter anterior to the adductor tubercle, as you have you seen it here? One centimeter to the to, from the adductor tubercle here, and then for the inferior, medic, um, inferior medial genicular nerve, it is horizontal, as I said, around the tibial medial epicondyle and passes beneath the medial collateral ligament at the midpoint between the tibial medial epicondyle and the tibial insertion of the MCL, the medial collateral ligament. So we have these images and we have these papers showing that, uh, and this is an interesting paper from uh, anatomist um, Franco in, um, in Chicago 2015, showing that to block the with um, and to uh, the maximum of lesioning of these final uh, um, um, articular branches in order to avoid any motor, motor, motor problem. Um, so uh, nerves, we know that uh, nerves branches um, showed variable proximal trajectory, but constant distal points 
of contact with femur and tibia. This is the important point. So we know branching is uh, important, but they are constant in their distal points of contact. Lymphorolateral peroneal nerve uh, branch was found to be close to the common perineal, making it inappropriate for radiofrequency uh, neurotomy. And this is also a representation of all this network of nerves coming from the sciatic nerve, uh, where we have a plexus uh, close to the popliteal vessels, and the tibial nerve, where the branches to the knee accompany the inferior medical genicular nerves, showing in here the vastus medialis nerves coming down. The posterior ca uh, capsule uh, is um, formed by the articular branches from the tibial nerve. Okay, they originate either proximal or distal to the superior border of the medial femoral condyle, and course traversally to the inferior, uh, the, to intercondyle. <laughs> condylar region between the medial and the lateral femoral condyle where they further branch again um, to, uh, to have this network of, of nerves. The articular branches from the sciatic and the common perineal nerve further divide into anterior and posterior branches to innervate the anterior lateral and posterior lateral capsule respectively. And finally, the posterior branch, the posterior arm of the obturator nerve courses through the adductor hiatus together with the femoral artery, as we've seen with the, this article from uh, the Danish group. At the level of the femoral condyle, it divides into two to three terminal branches to supply the superimedial aspect of the posterior capsule. So we have interest in this capsule, uh, um, posterior capsule in order to be uh, complete in our denervation. This is one of representation of the Nysora showing a very nice uh, picture of the uh, branches of the tibial nerve and the common perineal nerve. So to finish with um, this anatomical review, we have the guidance for radio frequency treatment. We know that we need to, uh, to be very effective. So we need to, um, to be accurate on our uh, target. And this is um, the reason where we will listen to Dr. Sadiq on that. Uh, we know that the branching in the middle of the, um, the femur and the tibia here will show better efficacy on all the papers that we've reviewed ultrasound guidance with the uh, genicular arteries as guidelines, as guide for us, will show a better efficacy uh, where you can target exact, exact um, uh, nerve denervation. So as a summary, articular branches of femoral, obturator, and sciatic nerve form a plexus of nerve supplying knee joint. Six groups of genicular nerves supply anterior uh, knee ca joint capsule, and posterior capsule is supplied by the sciatic plexus. Don't forget sciatic plexus and the obturator nerve with its uh, posterior division will be one of the, uh, the origin of these posterior supply. And the dual and hybrid, um, hybrid um, uh, guidance will be interesting to have very good uh, sensory denervation of the knee plexus. So uh, this is a, the article I was talking about and acknowledgement to Dr. Philip Pang with his excellent work on that. Thank you, and Sadiq, up to you. Thank you so much, Amr. That's great. All right. So you can see my screen, Amr? Yeah. Okay, no. Got it. So I'm just going to straight dive into my talk. Uh, let me just quickly get here you go. Right. So you heard the Amr's talk about the anatomy. So my talk is very much kind of based on what we do uh, when you come across a patient with chronic knee pain. Uh, so it's very much practical. It's like what I do it, how do I do it in my day-to-day -day kind of practice? Um, you know, there are various ways of doing things. You know, you could use conventional RF, you can use cooled RF, you can use uh, trident needles, so loads of ways uh, to do the radio frequency. But I'm going to tell you uh, the conventional RF technique that I use. Uh, so, uh, now, sensory denervation of major joints, uh, what are the patient selection criteria? Which are the patients who would be appropriate to undergo this procedure? So patients who, uh, where you can't actually consider them for arthroplasty or knee replacement, uh, given the cardiorespiratory cardio comorbidities. Arthroplasty not acceptable. So, you know, a few patients, they do not want to undergo surgery. So those kind of patients, who you could actually consider this uh, treatment. Arthroplasty not available in short term, you know, uh, young patients, patients who have early degenerative changes and uh, usually orthopedic surgeons do not want 
to do knee replacement in them at an earlier age because they will need a revision knee replacement. So those kind of patients where you would like to, to sort of, you know, consider this procedure. And arthroplasty fails to relieve pain uh, or causes more pain. So this is a patient uh, group with chronic post-surgical pain where they've undergone knee replacement, but pain still continues to be an issue. And I think uh, this is uh, basically another area where we could consider this procedure. So, uh, you know, from my point of view, the easier way to remember patients who are elderly with multiple comorbidities who have osteoarthritis or young patients who have osteoarthritis, patients reluctant to undergo surgery and patients with, who have had a knee replacement and have developed chronic post-surgical pain. So these are the kind of you know, group of patients where you could consider uh, knee radiofrequency. Okay, so other indications, I would say, you know, given that uh, COVID-19 pandemic is still continuing and we in the UK have now the, uh, the uh, another strain, the variant. Uh, so I think, you know, we have, we have heard about steroids and I think avoidance of steroids is an important uh, factor to consider. So radio frequency is going to be an alternative uh, patient waiting for joint replacements. And I can tell you majority of the healthcare systems uh, are, are being basically brought to an halt and we're going to have a long list of patients waiting to undergo uh, knee and hip replacements. And I think these are the patients where you could consider this treatment because that way you can avoid or taper their opiates and prevent the opiate crisis. Uh, and young patients waiting for arthroscopic elective uh, procedures. So those are the patients, you know, who are waiting for arthroscopic debridement. Uh, those are the patients where you could consider this procedure. Okay, so diving into the practical bit, uh, diagnostic block. Now, how do I do diagnostic block? You know, before you do a diagnostic block, always have a pre-procedure functional assessment in the form of Oxford Knee School. And also ask the patients to do the movements which bring their pain on. So, you know, the young patient, they say, you know, when I go up and down the stairs, you know, when I walk a long distance or when I stand up from sitting position or when I do stairs, those are the movements which will bring the pain on. And I usually ask them to do that. So I do that, followed by that, then I do an ultrasound guided uh, block. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, as Amar mentioned, the uh, majority of the targets are going to be superomedial, superolateral and uh, inframedial. Now, always remember, you need to ask them, where is your pain? If they say the pain is in the posterior part or it's the back of the knee, this is the area which is very, very difficult to manage. You know, if they have an anterior knee pain, those are the patients who would respond well to your radio frequency treatment. So it's always important to keep in mind. Other thing is target the nerves based on the location of pain. So if they have a medial compartment pain, just block superomedial and inferomedial genicular nerves. You don't need to block anything on the superolateral side because they don't have a lateral pain. So young patients who've got medial knee pain, just block the two nerves rather than blocking all of them, okay? So that's that's how my approach would be. But if they have a posterior knee pain, then I always tell the patients, you know, it's difficult to manage that pain with this procedure. Now, how do I perform the, the diagnostic block? You know, they can be supine position, head up, or I have a lot of patients who are elderly who come in wheelchair and sometimes I can do the procedure in the wheelchair. I just ask them to straighten up the knee. I put a pillow underneath their knee onto a stool and straighten their knee and I can do the procedure that way. So uh, pillow under the knee helps the patients to get some comfort. Full asepsis, you know, ultrasound guided, out of plane, and you don't need too long needles. Actually, you need you need you know, unless your patient is high BMI patient, then you might need a longer needle. But majority of times, you'll find a 25 gauge needle, uh, you know, a, a, a hypodermic needle or a stimuplex 50 millimeter needle will be more than enough to do a diagnostic block. And uh, remember, the key here is the volume of the local anesthetic. Do not put anything more than two mLs of local anesthetic. One and a half to two mLs is what I inject, because if you put more than, you know, two cc, it doesn't stay as a diagnostic block because, you know, the local anesthetic might infiltrate through the joint capsule and it won't be a diagnostic block as such. So I think it's very important to keep this in mind. Now, pre and post procedure pain scores and functional assessment. So I usually give them a pain diary, ask them to fill up the pain diary for 24 hours, and then they send the pain diary to me in the post. Uh, and based on how much difference the pain that the block has made, and I usually ask them to make the note as well, were they able to do stairs better at home? Were they able to get up from the chair? Were they able to kind of get out of the bed properly? And that is very important. So remember, pain scores on their own 
isn't going to add too much of value. You need to have some kind of functional assessment to make the right kind of you know decision. Because if you're book booking them for a radio frequency, you want to improve the success of your radio frequency, and you need to choose the right patient. So it's very important to do the proper assessment of the diagnostic block before you consider them for radio frequency treatment. Okay, so how do I do it? So this is the setup. So, you know, I do ultrasound guided. And as uh, the, the Dr. Alam and, uh, you know, Dr. Salty mentioned that, you know, if you can do this procedure ult under ultrasound, why to use, you know, uh, you know x-rays? So this is my technique. So this is what I do, uh, you know, and uh, in terms of radio frequency, so diagnostic block entirely done under ultrasound guidance. Now, radio frequency technique, so radio frequency technique, we, t we teach this technique at Gulf Pain School called Cuff Technique, which is a combined ultrasound and fluoroscopy guided technique. And uh, we teach Cuff Technique from various other pain blocks, so hip, shoulder, SIJ, cervical RF, lumbar sympathetic block, cordial epidural. So various other places where you can actually use a Cuff Technique. Now, this is how I would do. So I would put the pillow underneath the patient's knee. And, uh, you know, I usually kind of, you know, uh, do the marking on the skin. Now, obviously, this is just a skin marking. This is like stop before you block. So I usually mark the patient in theater so we know we are actually blocking the appropriate side and we're doing the appropriate side radio frequency treatment. So this is the setup. You put a drape underneath the knee after pro proper cleaning. And uh, remember, antiseptic uh, technique is a sort of, you know, aseptic technique is very important here. You're dealing with the joints. So take this very, very seriously, especially if patients have had a previous knee replacement, be very, very careful because you do not want to introduce an infection if they have already got a joint replacement. So very important. So this is how the technique would be. So you could see here with my arrow, I've got an X-ray machine, I've got an ultrasound machine parked opposite. So I will do the cleaning and I'll do kind of a double prep and then drape it as you would do, uh, you know, make sure everything is kind of not properly draped, uh, followed by this. Uh, before I stick a needle, uh, you know, I will do another bit of cleaning. Now, consider me as an OCD, you know, obsessive compulsive disorder for cleaning. But when it comes to the joints, do not take a chance because, you know, stitch in time saves nine. If you have any doubt, just prep again. So I would prep now. This is my usual setup. You would have the kind of radio frequency electrode and radio frequency needles, these are the conventional needles. Now, things that I have changed over a period of time, I've dished out steroids, I do not inject steroids after, after the radio frequency treatment. So that's something that I've changed. Plenty of local anesthetic, okay? So if you're doing your RF, you don't have to worry about the, diag you know, diagnostic block is where you would keep an eye on the amount of local anesthetic you inject. But when you're doing an RF, use a decent amount of local anesthetic. So you do not have to worry about kind of, you know, giving any sedation. I do not give sedation to the patients, uh, you know, uh, so majority of the procedure gets done only under local anesthetic. Uh, so this is the technique. So you've got the ultrasound probe cover covering the probe and the patients in the figure of four kind of position of the leg. Uh, then you will start to scan. This is the RF machine covered by the drape so I can operate that along with the ultrasound machine and the X-ray machine. So this is how I would do it. You start with the longitudinal scan. You look for the kind of, you know, arterial pulsation. Once you get the arterial pulsation, you bring that in the middle of the ultrasound screen and that becomes in the middle of the probe. And then you turn the ultrasound probe uh, sort of, you know, uh, transversely. Uh, and then you will mark the skin on the, on the mark, mark the skin with the marker. And this is how I would do it. So once you mark the skin, you put the ultrasound probe there. And that tells you that you are at the junction of the shaft and the condyle. And then you will do a local anesthetic infiltration. And once the local anesthetic infiltration is done, you will position the needle. So same way I'm doing, so I've done inferior medial here, I'm going on to the superior medial. So once you mark the skin, you turn the ultrasound probe uh, by 90 degrees, and then you will use the ultrasound to place the needle. So remember, when you're doing entirely with the x-rays, you're gonna be trying to get a gun barrel view, but you're not doing entirely with the x-rays, we're doing with the ultrasound. And I'll tell you advantages of that in a minute, but this is how you want. You want the, the needle positioning at the junction of the shaft and the condyle. So that's very important. Same here, tibial condyle and tibial shaft and the needle positioning there. So you will, you might find the needles are going that way. No, because if you're using ultrasound, you are going to basically look at the needle hugging the bone. So it's very important to actually use the ultrasound uh, in order to in order to get a, a, get get a good target. So then then you do a lateral X-ray. This is how I would do it. 
And then, you know, this is what Amr showed you earlier on. Uh, this is the needle positioning in the middle of the shaft uh, and condyle junction. So this is a sort of, you know, femoral shaft and your needle is actually positioned there. Now, one more thing nowadays I do after the new literature, I will position another needle. And this is basically the adductor tubercle. So you, I will, you know, introduce another needle to catch more branches of the nerves because this nerve is divided. So, you know, you will do one lesion, stack lesion, do a lesion, pull the needle out, do another lesion, pull the needle out, do another lesion. And then I will introduce another needle here and try and get those branches which are there from the superior medial genicular nerve, which are actually branching at the adductor, adductor tubercle. Now, moving on to the inferior medial, as you could see, that's the lateral X-ray view, and you have the needle positioned uh, at the junction of the shaft and the condyle. And in terms of the lateral view, you are actually at the middle of the of the of the anterior border and posterior border of the shaft. So that's that's my positioning. Now, advantages of the cuff technique. Why do you think that the cuff technique is useful? Uh, and why do I think it's useful? Because you're not going to use that much of radiation. You use very less radiation. You avoid the injury to the blood vessels because with the x-rays, you're not gonna see any blood vessels, but with the ultrasound, you will be able to target uh, the nerve properly without injuring the blood vessel. You reduce needle passes because it's a real time needle positioning. Uh, you will be able to put the needle exactly in the target. So it's not in and out. It improves the patient comfort. You know, these patients, you know, they have got chronic pain. You really want to perform the procedure with very minimal uh, sort of, you know, pain. Uh, and patient needs to be, you know, uh, you know, find that more as a comfortable procedure. And it improves the accuracy and, and better outcomes. Because if you're targeting them in the right spot, the accuracy, uh, with, the, with the good accuracy, the outcomes are better. And uh, the reason I use x-rays is to save the images for the reviews later. You know, if you have an ultrasound imaging technique where you can actually save the images, it's always good. Uh, but I think, you know, x-rays, we always do the x-rays because if you're doing a radio frequency, if you're actually, uh, you know, doing the kind of uh, heat lesioning of the nerves, a conventional RF, it's always recommended to have the x-rays because you can review them later if there, is, if there happens to be a complication. Okay, so in terms of the technique which I showed you, we actually had the whole webinar series on this, which we ran in July. So joint denervation webinar series or focusing on hip, knee and shoulder. We're just giving you a snapshot. It is actually available on the Gulf Pain School's website. So do go on the Gulf Pain School website and it's divided into lessons. So you, you can actually get detailed lessons, about four hours of learning uh, with anatomy, evidence and practical approach. And there are live ultra sound uh, demos there on the on the on the on the on the website uh, with regards to how do we do this procedure so it's, it's a practical webinar to the point uh, we have phantom model uh, needling uh, as a part of the webinar a skeletal anatomy and it was approved for eight cpd points by royal college so if you you know want to access that you can access that and you can get the cpd points and the certificate so you know i will i will put in a link on the on the chat box but uh, do join us on the social media platform and uh, on the YouTube channel, we've got plenty of good content on the YouTube channel, uh, plenty of webinars, which we actually uh, uh, ran. Uh, we have could put recordings there. So uh, that's it uh, from my side. You know, I do invite you guys to join us for low limb MSK workshop where we will be covering the knee joint uh, kind of, you know, uh, ultrasound as well as RF and uh, uh, diagnostic block technique. Uh, so questions, right, Amar? You there? Yep. Okay. Thank so, you. Great. Okay. We, we did. Proud and practical. This is what we want to show in our group. Uh, can you explain the cuff technique, uh, Tariq? Okay. So cuff technique is basically, as I said, combined ultrasound and fluoroscopy technique. Uh, I think uh, we at a girl pain school actually just devised this term because we, we teach a lot of uh, interventions where you want to have accuracy and real time needling using ultrasound. And at the same time, you want to save the images for medical legal purpose. And also if you're doing an RF, it's always advisable to have an image that you can save in an archive, which you can visit again in future if needed. So, you know, you can perform a lot of procedures using a cuff technique, you know, hip denervation, shoulder denervation, caudal epidural. Now, a lot, of, a lot of people say, you know, you can do caudal with ultrasound. Yes, you can, but you cannot rule out the intravascular placement of the needle with the ultrasound. 
you do need to have x-ray to look at the spread of the dye. So that's why it's always important to actually use a combined technique in order to improve the safety as well as the efficacy of the procedure. So that's that's cut technique. Okay. So because of COVID, you stopped using the steroids, right? right. Yes. So the denervation is the your first choice uh, after diagnostic block, of course. That's right. Yes. So that's what I would okay. do for patients with the chronic knee pain, second door osteoarthritis, is do a diagnostic block. And if the diagnostic block proves to be beneficial, we'll perform radiofrequency. Now, I have a question here, Amal, saying that regarding diagnostic mm -hmm. block, is it 2 ml per site or total? No, it's uh, 1 and a half to 2 ml per site. That's what I would inject. Nothing, yes. nothing more than that. Amar, we have a question for you. What is your opinion about adding saphenous nerve block or adductor canal block to the genicular nerve block? Does that make any difference? Um, yeah, when you, have, when you do the, the conventional ones and you denervate uh, the inframedial superomedial and superolateral, and you think that the result is not good, that you need sometimes to go for the plexus, posterior plexus first, the popliteal plexus, uh, that going from the saphenous, uh, you'll be more, it's a sensory, of course, but you will be, um, you'll not be targeting and you'll not be denervating the saphenous anyway. You just do an injection, but the denervation should be in the nerve, the articular branches, terminal articular branches, uh, which are divided into three areas. If needed, you can add, sometimes you go even for the inferolateral if we need to be really, if the pain is, and this is the what we call the follow the pain paradigm, where pain is starting and then you can do it, but with precautions because it can have palsy of the common perineal. So, um, saphenous, no, it's not my first choice. Uh, I can do it for any knee pain as acute pain, but not for denervation. Right. And we have a question on use of 20% uh, dextrose for the nerve block. I think we had, a, we had a good webinar from Stanley Lam, I think. <laughs> I think uh, yeah. it was a fantastic webinar. So Stan actually told us, and I, I have started to use that in my kind of clinical practice, where a lot of times if you use you know, you don't need to use 20% dextrose. You can use a 5% dextrose, but hydrodissection of these nerves uh, can be a, a good way to reduce the pain because, you know, you might have patients where, you know, a radio frequency might not be an option. For example, if somebody has, a, you know, you can do radio frequency with the pacemakers, but you, you can do a bipolar rather than, you know, a unipolar. So you can avoid the pacemaker issues. But uh, patients uh, where, you know, you if you want to use hydrodissection, yes, you can use it with 5% dextrose. And I've, you know, I've, I've done that in a few patients. So what's your view? What's your take on it, Amar? Yeah, the regenerative medicine is one of the new era where we are learning about it. So the five, some people, they use 10 and or 20, 25. So the, the, the idea of it is to stimulate the regeneration and... Uh, this is the point. Uh, can use it. I've used it for some patients, for a patient, but uh, I don't have long data on that. We, le we learned from uh, Stanley Lam and um, our group, um, our friends in Taiwan, about the efficacy compared to uh, steroids and compared to um, hyaluronic acid. So it's recommended, yeah. Great. Right, Amar, we're going to have a five-minute break, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, after that, we will reconvene. But what I'm going to do during the break, I'm just going to run through the presentation for people who joined it a bit later. And we will just play our video uh, with regards to the Gulf Pain School. So, you know, okay. um, we, will, we will come back in five minutes, guys. So if you want to stand up, stretch your legs, do feel free to do that whilst I'm just going to go through this video with you.
Amar, are you there? <laughs> right, guys, so those of you who are still there, we'll just kind of, you know, go through the kind of, you know, intro lecture. Those who you joined later, we, you know, whilst people are taking a break, we will just go through this. So next talk we have is on management of MSK issues after spinal cord injury uh, by my, my very good friend, Dr. Rohit Bide. He's from Sheffield University. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, talks on uh, deep gluteal pain syndrome uh, and carpal tunnel syndrome, um, followed by pelvic pain management. So, and then we'll close at uh, 7 p.m. UK time probably before that. So thank you Sam, so much for staying with us. So whilst kind of, you know, going through things, uh, I thought I'll just quickly tell you about our upcoming courses. So we have a uh, kind of, you know, upper limb MSK course, uh, which is coming up in January. And uh, then we have a lower limb MSK course coming up in February. Uh, we are basically running this course uh, as very much practical course in terms of uh, the, the, the teaching. We will be focusing on the anatomy, sono anatomy, skeletal anatomy, ultrasound guided uh, videos with pro positioning, live domos. And we have faculty from eight different countries. So I'm sure it will be it will be a great course. And then a lower limb MSK course in February as well. And we have included the diagnostic bits, so diagnostic ultrasound as well as diagnostic MRI scans. And uh, when to you know uh, refer these patients for a diagnostic scan? So we have a radiologist, the MSK radiologist, who will talk to us about that. And we have uh, faculty, as I said, from Italy, from Spain, Turkey. Uh, you know, UK, UAE, as well as uh, from Hong Kong uh, and from USA. So uh, I'm sure it will be a great course for you guys to attend, uh, you know, uh, so do join us. Uh, I will put up the links for the uh, WhatsApp uh, in the chat box. So if you guys want to join and get the updates for the future courses, then that would be, that would be a good way to, to keep, keep updated. So thank you so much. Right. So Amar, you back. Uh, we have uh, Rohit here. Yes. So Rohit, I'm going to make you a co-host. I've actually made you a co-host already, I think. Can you hear us, Rohit? Rohit? Yep. Okay. Fantastic. Yep. Great stuff. Okay. So uh, Dr. Rohit Bide, he's a consultant rehabilitation medicine at the University of Sheffield. Uh, uh, Rohit did his fellowship. Uh, we actually did our fellowships uh, in Toronto. Mm -hmm. That's where I met Rohit. And, uh, you know, he's, 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 he's an excellent speaker uh, and does deal with uh, spinal rehab, one of the well-known centers in the UK, in Sheffield University. Uh, and uh, who, who could be a better person to talk to us about MSK issues following the spinal cord injuries. So Rohit, off to you. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Sadiq. Uh, 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 it's a great opportunity and thank you uh, for allowing me to present uh, my work here. But yes, I'm going to talk about MSK issues following spinal cord injury. And uh, if you look at the previous talks, my talk probably will be a slight deviant uh, from the previous talks, which have been very much around pain and uh, pain focused and interventions. Uh, there will be a bit of interventions, but this will be more about spe MSK issues specific to spinal cord injury. And I'm also going to try and share some of the Sheffield experience because I thought uh, given that we are the second largest center, uh, it will be useful to uh, share so, sort of over the years what some of our practices. So. Uh, uh, I think the MSK issues that I'm going to cover primarily will be spasticity, contractures, and heterotopic ossification. Uh, I'll touch very briefly on osteoporosis and fragility fractures, but I'm not really going to go into overviews, injuries, or MSK pain issues because those will be well covered in the subsequent lectures and have already been covered before me. So just before sort of uh, we move on, in terms of disclosures, uh, I don't have anything to declare. Uh, and before this talk, I thought it will be worthwhile going through sort of what we do or what spinal cord services in the UK and Ireland comprise of. So there are a total of 12 centers, if you consider Ireland as well. And usually as per the spinal cord specifications, the care provided is <clears throat> uh, from injury to grave. 
So essentially, when a person sustains a spinal cord injury, they become life or they are offered lifelong follow-ups for the rest of their life. And that means that if there are issues that are going to come on uh, along the way, then it's appropriate that we tackle them in a very timely manner uh, so as to not uh, to get, uh, allow them to become more graver uh, as we go along. So uh, moving on to spasticity and contractures, uh, I think contractures, we all know what what it is and what causes it. Prolonged joint immobilization certainly does it. But if you ask me, I think if it is primarily driven by plasticity or upper motor neuron tightness, and if we can prevent that from happening, then it, it is a good way of handling or managing things. And we'll talk about that briefly as we go along th through this talk. So <clears throat> in terms of upper limbs, uh, Primarily tetraplegics, let's say if we have a C5 tetraplegic who has a very good functioning biceps muscle, but no active triceps or any other muscle actively, you tend to see them getting into this pos uh, posture or position. I don't know whether everybody can see me, but this is the sort of position that they assume because of unopposed action from the deltoid overcoming the pectoralis major. And then the biceps sort of keeping the elbow flexed most of the time, <coughs> but also the forearm ends up being supine or sort of in this position because biceps also has the supinator action, uh, which tends to sort of leave them in a very non-functional, non-useful position. And you certainly want, don't want them to reach that level, uh, which will certainly need surgical interventions down the line. And when it comes to lower limbs, you tend to see very often flexion and adduction contractures. Uh, this, occasionally, you do end up getting windswept deformity. So on the one side, you end up getting an abduction deformity. And on the other hip, you end up getting an adduction deformity. And the patients end, uh, sort of are most of the time in a windswept deformity position. Knee flexion contractures, I think, are, until a point it reaches up to 90 degrees, it's acceptable because patients are still able to sit uh, with these contractures. But beyond that, uh, they start creating more trouble and problems. And we all know sort of the other problems with ankle, like equino cavo varus positioning, like an inversion position, which prevents the foot from resting properly on a foot rest. And we certainly don't want to reach that position. So in order to avoid that, I think it's the time to intervene is when the spasticity is becoming, starting to become a problem. And we all know that spasticity is an upper motor neuron syndrome primarily sort of presenting as hyperexcitability of stretch reflexes and uh, other features. But it is quite widely prevalent. Now, early 2000s, the thought was that somewhere around 50 or 80% people uh, experience spasticity following spinal cord injury. But a more recent one, uh, sort of a paper from North America, followed up 1,800 adults uh, and showed that it was actually around 85% in these individuals or <clears throat> patient population. And furthermore, I think over a period of five years, there is a 31% increase in the mean severity of the spasticity as well. So there is a need. So what a person will be experiencing at today will be probably much lower or much less severe than what they will be experiencing five years down the line. So it's important to intervene at the right time, because otherwise it will end up getting into a contracture. Is spasticity always problematic? Not really. It also offers some benefits. Uh, it also offers some benefits, but uh, we do need to sort of take into consideration and find that balance. I think another uh, publication from 2018, uh, which was an international initiative. It had authors from North America, Australia, Europe, and they came up with this <clears throat> flow diagram, which if you spend some time with it, uh, it makes a lot of sense. But uh, I have always relied on this pyramid diagram, which is a seven step approach to spasticity, or you could say contracture management as well. And it starts off with the basic prevention and reduction of noxious stimulus, moving on to sort of modalities, serial casting, splints, and then trying oral medications. Now, we, there are several specific spasticity medications, but by the time you are using up to three medications, you need to really start thinking about the next level, and that will be intrathecal baclofen pump. We are all sort of well aware of the role of botulinum toxin and phenol 
for focal spasticity, but when it comes to global spasticity management, you are looking at an intrathecal baclofen pump because that can have an impact on pain. Some of our Sheffield uh, intrathecal baclofen pump experience. Uh, the service began back in 1988, which is quite some time ago. And a quick review over the last 10 years shows that we have done somewhere around 120 pumps. Uh, 75 of them were new and 46 were replacement. And the reason for high replacement is that the pump battery runs out after every seven years. So even though the pump may be functioning perfectly well, at the end of seven years, it does need a replacement because the battery just runs out. So it usually involves just a pump change rather than a catheter change. And I think what has worked in our favor, because I can certainly say that in the spinal cord population within the UK, Sheffield has the highest cohort or largest cohort of patients under regular follow-up for baclofen service. Uh, I think what works is because as medics, we do the pump surgeries and the test doses. So we sort of have the freedom, but we also are able to pick up patients at the right time rather than relying on somebody else having to do that surgery or putting in that referral and the pump ha surgery happening six months down the line. Whereas we are able to pick up and sort of do those surgeries in a very timely manner. And then followed by the Paclofin refill service, which is actually led by the excellent clinic nurses and the team that we have, which allows us the freedom to carry on with our other clinical commitments and activities. Uh, and yeah, that, that's, that's more or less. Uh, overall, sort of, we, we all know about the other available procedures. But then by the time it comes to contractures, we are really looking at soft tissue releases and bony procedures, whether it's osteotomies. Rohit, let me just mute people. Whether, whether it's osteotomies or bony procedures or uh, excision arthroplasties. Having talked about spasticity and uh, contractures a bit, I think I'll move on to heterotopic ossification. Uh, again, this is something very unique in the rehab medicine population or rehab pay, pay, uh, rehabilitation patients because uh, it happens most often with we are all aware of the traumatic heterotopic ossification, but there is also an entity called neurogenic heterotopic ossification. And this is what we encounter on a regular basis. It is essentially pathological bone uh, being deposited in muscle or soft tissue. Now, literature search shows that the incidence could be quite high, uh, almost sometimes up to 80% and percent loss. Now, surprisingly, uh, in Sheffield, we do not tend to see those high numbers. And I've spoken to my colleagues across the uh, country. And again, their numbers sort of seem to be somewhere between two to five. I would go more with sort of closer to two or three percent rather than five percent. And I can certainly say that that is not because of lack of imaging or anything like that. Because we follow our patients lifelong, we do see them on a yearly basis and they do get imaged quite heavily. So if there are, they are experiencing symptoms suggestive of heterotopic ossification, they will be picked up. But certainly not so much compared to sort of other publications from elsewhere in the world. Now, if we were to look at sort of how it presents or develops, it does occur within the first four months with the peak incidence happening at around two months. And almost invariably it is below the level of paralysis. Now, when it comes to brain injury or traumatic brain injury, you do get it anywhere in the body, but with spinal cord injury, it's certainly below the level of paralysis. And hip joint is the most commonly uh, sort of involved joint followed by knee, elbow and shoulder. Uh, I think many of us are aware of the traumatic myositis ossificans, which happens uh, in the orthopedic patient population but it's the neurogenic myositis ossificans that we are really interested in, we are going to talk about today. And when it comes to pathophysiology, again, nobody really knows what's happening. There, are, there have been several theories, there have been several publications around what may be contributing or what may be causing this. Eventually, what has been postulated is at some point, due to the interplay of all the factors, growth factors, interleukins and proteins and everything coming together, the pluripotent mesenchymal cells undergo metaplastic change. And in one way or the other, they do stimulate the osteoblast, which then eventually 
deposit the bone as the heterotopic bone. Uh, I think this is just an example of one of our patients. Uh, I do believe, I think we have a cadaveric sample or specimen of the left hip uh, with us as well of the same patient. And this is just a uh, 3D reconstruction showing that once, if, if allowed to sort of progress on, it can become quite bothersome or problematic. You can, one can very well imagine the restriction in hip joint flexion uh, and the difficulty this patient would have faced uh, if he tried sitting in a wheelchair. But it doesn't necessarily always happen in the spinal cord patients. You can get a heterotopic ossification at the distal end of the amputee or residue uh, amputated stump. You can get it around the prosthesis or you can just get it following a hematoma collection in the, around the hip joint. So in the spinal cord population, what are the risk factors? We know that being uh, or having a complete neurological deficit or, or a complete spinal cord injury as an Asia A injury is certainly a very high risk, puts you at a very high risk. But the other factors really don't make any much sense. One could argue that spasticity, yes, leading to micro traumas, but when you look at pneumonia, nicotine news, urinary tract infections, one wonders whether these were part of a regression analysis uh, through a major meta-analysis. And probably there may be a role for either hypoxia or an inflammatory process in the background, which may be contributing to all of this. Uh, but again, as I said, <clears throat> one really doesn't know. If I were to take all these risk factors together and start screening patients for heterotopic ossification, I think one or the other person will surely come up uh, and everybody will need some prophylaxis or screening. So how does it present? Uh, I think uh, I've, I've written down some set of symptoms that heterotopic ossification presents in the initial stages. And if I were to give these set of symptoms to an acute medicine uh, specialist or a surgeon, the type of differentials that I'll get will be like along these lines, a DVT, a fracture, or a septic arthritis or a cellulitis. And it is due to the fact that we are sort of in the rehabilitation medicine domain that we are able to sort of pick up a heterotopic ossification early on. Uh, this is again, another example of a patient who presented to us with restricted right hip range, but by the time sort of he was aged and evaluated, the HO had already progressed and matured. Uh, in terms of diagnosis, initial inflammatory markers like ESR and CRP may point towards something not being right. Alkaline phosphatase is known to be increased because it's a marker of bone turnover, but otherwise also it can be quite high in such patients. Imaging does offer uh, some opportunities to pick this up early, specifically ultrasound, CT or bone scans. By the time actually the new bone starts appearing on an X-ray, the boat has already sailed. So I think if at all somebody needs to or somebody wants to pick up a HO early on, one has to rely on the other modalities rather than an X-ray. A CT scan can help many a times if some specific surgical intervention is planned. It does show a peripheral mineralization as the bone starts going around the new bone. Uh, but the most sensitive of these investigations is the tri triple phase bone scan. Of these, the first two phases uh, indicate hyperemia and blood pooling and can, be, uh, can point towards an early occurrence or possibility of HO being starting to uh, set in. Uh, one of the sort of diagrams that I've always found useful when it comes to HO is this one, which goes gives a nice temporal relation or correlation of sort of how symptoms, how blood tests and how investigation sort of fall in into the whole clinical scenario as the weeks go by. And you can see that the although the ESR and sort of starts rising quite early, alkaline phosphatase only sort of reaches its peak by the fifth and sixth week by when the bone has actually started to deposit and <clears throat> mature uh, as just possible. And there have been attempts at classifying heterotopic ossification. Again, given its, given its sort of predominance around the hip joint, uh, the Brooker's classification is used very frequently, which starts off with 
showing bone islands around the hip joint and then osteophytes or sort of bony outgrowths or spurs which are more than 1 cm or less than 1 cm <clears throat> gap to finally sort of notice noticing an ankylosis around the hip joint and but the unfortunate thing about brucus is that it is applicable only to the hip joint uh uh heterotopic ossification it doesn't allow you to cover other joints and that's where some of the uh, garland and orvin classification comes into picture it can be used for any other sort of joint involvement but again the downside to that is that it is a subjective uh, criteria or classification in terms of treatments the two systematic reviews do point towards the role of rofecoxib and indomethacin in preventing ho but again from a clinical experience point of view i would say that if the uh, incidence of uh, ho is low then the validity of giving rofecoxib or indomethacin in so many patients uh, may need to be justified uh, i believe the numbers needed to be numbers needed to treat or numbers needed to prevent an ho in such patients will be quite high and i certainly we don't do it in sheffield uh, as such in terms of trying to prevent hos but once established i think etidronet has certainly been shown or other bisphosphonates have been shown to have a good role in keeping it under control uh once the bone has formed and matured surgical resection certainly becomes the mainstay and there have been some uh, limited evidence around radiotherapy and other modalities in sheffield again we have done a few surgical resections of uh, uh, heterotopic ossifications with limited success this particular case although presented with initially with quite impressive looking heterotopic ossification one can see that he also had some ischial ulcers which had caused a reactive osteomyelitis as well thankfully on ct scan he had a cleft between the ho which allowed him to bend his hip so hip flexion wasn't an issue but on a ct reconstruction we could see that the ischial tuberosity had significant sort of extra bone deposition which needed addressing before the bone closure now moving on to osteoporosis and fragility fractures i'm going to cover this very briefly uh mainly because this is something that is otherwise very widely covered uh, in other areas as such uh we know that in the spinal cord population hypercalciuria and hypercalcemia uh, are the two uh, sort of hallmark presentations during the early few months uh by the time patients are one or two years down the line the bone mineral density is supposed to be around 25 to 50% of what of their able bodied peers uh this certainly predisposes these patients to lower extremity fragility fractures and to a degree <clears throat> it has been said that fractures around the distal femur and proximal are yeah, actually can be labeled as paraplegic fracture people have used that term before in terms of investigations we know about the biochemical markers or bone imaging but dexa and uh, peripheral quantitative ct do sort of offer a lot of lot more information in terms of identifying uh, and getting quantitative data for uh, treating these uh, for treating the osteoporosis uh, when it comes to spinal cord injury i think it is known that rather than the three conventional sites of the distal radius lumbar vertebrae and the neck uh, and the hip joint it is much more useful to image or do a dexa around the proximal uh, tibia and the distal femur because these are the sites which sustain a lot of those paraplegic fractures as we said and most often it happens in the paraplegic population who are doing lot of transfers and end up doing torsional forces around their knee joint during these such transfers <clears throat> Uh, i think dr craven from toronto has done a lot of work around finding risk factors through regression analysis and through multiple publications and what sort of which patients are predisposed to developing these fractures and she uh, in one of her papers alludes to some of these uh, factors amongst them i think interestingly the from a spinal cord specific point of view motor complete lesions and paraplegia makes sense because if you are a tetraplegic very often you will need you will have either a hoist or somebody helping you for transfers uh, but also another factor or another point to remember is many of these patients 
do experience a lot of pain which could be nociceptive or neuropathic pain and could be on opioids or anticonvulsants which put which makes them uh sort of vulnerable to developing osteoporosis as well uh in terms of secondary causes again i think uh, having seen it in toronto they have dedicated clinics sort of which are bone health consultations for his spinal cord patients where a very detailed workup is done uh, also looking for those secondary factors that i just mentioned in the previous slides and then appropriate treatments are referred to uh it is important to consider drug holidays as well because of osteonecrosis of the jaw and other uh, problems that occur with long term treatments from a sheffield experience point of view uh, we don't do normal screening for dexa and bone mineral densities for sci patients we do encourage patients to be on vitamin d supplementation but when patients do experience or have fragility fractures then a thorough workup is undertaken with the help of our metabolic bone colleagues so that's more or less about osteoporosis we we are aware of the treatment options be it pharmacological be it non pharmacological uh there have been several studies trying to assess the efficacy of these treatments but it is said that the these things work as long as they are being given or prescribed and the moment you stop these treatments the bone mineral density again starts going downhill and then finally when patients do sustain fragility fractures or osteoporotic fractures the most important question is whether to operate or not and very often we tell or we liaise with the orthopedic colleagues to tell them that if if the fracture is not displaced and if it's not causing much trouble it's better not to operate on it and manage it conservatively having said that if it is a very badly displaced fracture if it's a complex fracture then certainly there is merit in operating such patient on on such patients there are a few studies i, I believe from europe and from iran which have looked at their sort of outcomes from patients who have been operated and who have not been operated and they found that people who were operated had much less complications so there may be some merit in suggesting operations but obviously that set population or that those set of patients need to be identified quite appropriately and then finally i think I, as i said or oh, in terms of the overuse syndromes we are all aware aware of the musculoskeletal overuse syndromes that spinal cord patients sustain they end up using their shoulders hands and arms quite heavily and tend to obviously have all the long term degenerative changes including rotator cuff tears osteoarthritis and overuse syndromes i'm not going to go into the details given the time constraints but i'm happy to take questions related to that thank you thanks very much uh, rohit that was fantastic i think you know the you know for us certainly it was uh, quite useful to know as pain physicians because you know a lot of times we have patients with uh, kind of you know uh, hemiplegia or spinal cord injury and we get called to say what well, come and have a look at this patient who might have a, a particular msk problem and i think it's good to know about the the the, the conditions that you mentioned the overuse uh, and also the uh, abnormal calcification around the joints i think it's quite quite useful now i don't think we have any questions at the moment but we i, we, I thought we will take the questions after we have uh, you know dr sanga's talk so what we'll do if you hang around for the next few minutes i think we'll we'll get uh, uh, dr harpreet sanga from from uh, toronto so harp are you there can you kindly share your screen Uh, I'm just going to exit and uh, come back in. Uh, I, I've, I've uh, muffed up a little bit here. Okay, no problem. Now <laughs> I'll get you co-hosting again. No problem. Right, Amar, do you have any questions? I think we do have. Do you have any questions on your side? Not in the. Do you have questions yourself? I think you know. I actually said to Roy that we'll take question answers after after the next next talk. So now we do we do. I've, I've tried. I think. Um, uh, Professor Omri and uh, Dr. Mittal, uh, they're trying to join us, but they have been struggling with regards to problems from the network. So we'll see whether they can join. Otherwise, you know, yeah. uh, uh, 
Dr. Sangha's talk might be the last one, so, but we'll see. I think he, you know, I've tried to see whether they can connect us uh, on, but I think they've had uh, issues with regards to the internet. So, okay, uh, we have a question here, Rohit, whilst we're waiting for, for Harp to join us, is, uh, is HO can happen in pediatric patient? So can, can that be an issue in pediatric patients? So I think, yes, there is nothing to suggest because the mechanisms probably happen to be the same. Having said that, I don't really know in terms of numbers because the our center looks after only adult patients, but I can't see if, if, if the same mechanisms are at play, then it will be a possibility in pediatric spinal cord patients as well. Okay, great. So I think, uh, yeah, but as you say, you know, your practice mostly adult patients. So, and uh, the role of uh, range of movement in profile axis and treatment of uh, HO. So, is any. I think absolutely. Uh, because maintenance of range of movement uh, will be the key in preventing HO ca causing sort of re range restriction. So, it certainly is people argue whether that can itself cause further sort of uh, damage or hematoma, which will result in further heterotopic ossification. But we don't see that. I think maintenance of range of motion does play a very key role in preventing becoming problematic. Right. And we've got one last question here on this uh, about the etidronate therapy for, and would you kind of you know, recommend that for prevention of the HO and how long? So I think there are a few studies about use of bisphosphonates, uh, not only specifically limited to etidronate. I think a range of bisphosphonates have been used. Yeah. Uh, again, in terms of justification, I find it difficult because you are talking about prophylaxis during the acute spinal cord injury, where a patient is sort of spending much of the time on bed rest and some time on wheelchair and getting with their therapy. And do you really want to sort of do that if the numbers are not going to be that high. And I think it will need a real justification of pros and cons or benefits. And the bisphosphonate therapy itself has its own problems as well. Yes. So why to expose to the patient? Great, right. So we're going to move on to the next talk. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to sort of, you know, introduce uh, and also to sort of, you know, uh, you know, it's an honor that we have uh, uh, Dr. Harp Sangha, who is, uh, a, you know, a professor in the uh, University of Toronto. Uh, he also works at Toronto Rehab Center. Uh, Harp is, is a great speaker. He also has kind of, you know, he's, he, you know, he's written book chapters. He's written many articles. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I saw Harp first time on the iPad when I was looking at Philip Peng's uh, ebook. On the on the uh, ultrasound guided interventions, where Harp is a person who is actually showing the examination of the SIJ examination of the shoulder joint. So, excellent speaker we have. Uh, a pleasure to have you, Harp. So, if you can sort of you know share your screen, and he's going to talk to us about uh, you know median nerve uh, hydrodissection uh, using dextrose. So I think it's a, it's a it's a great topic and. Uh, you know, I think he's he's actually collecting the data as well, and he's done this many times. So I think you know, and he's got fantastic videos. I've actually gone through his presentation. So, right, Harp, off to you. We can see your screen. Thank you. Okay, great. So, Sadiq, first of all, thanks for having me. It's a it's a real honor. Um, I just I wanted to uh, talk about something uh, in terms of hydro dissection, which I know we've got a broad group of uh, people here, uh, but I just wanted to talk about uh, something that maybe. Uh, us as the rehabilitation physicians out there, uh, the orthos, the physiatrists, uh, aren't as um, uh, sort of knowledgeable about. I know that a lot of my physiatry colleagues are not uh, familiar with higher dissection. Up until recently, when some of the new uh, data um, sort of around uh, this has, has come out, uh, and so now at uh, our institution, uh, I'm being asked to do this a lot because of the data that's come out in the last uh, sort of couple of years. Uh, I know the anesthetists were, have been doing it for, for a very long time. I know when I was a fellow with Philip Pang, uh, he sort of changed the way that I, I did uh, uh, nerve blocks at sites of entrapments to include a hydrodissection component to it. 
With respect to disclosures, uh, unfortunately, I don't have any, but if anybody uh, wants to give me some money, I am more than happy to stay behind on this Zoom meeting. Um, <laughs> That's a good one, Harv. I think I, you know, we'll be sending you the check soon. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, um, so I thought we would go first between uh, what the what hydro dissection is for, for a lot of the, the rehab physicians and, and orthos out there, and then discuss the role of this in common entrapment neuropathies. And then outline the evidence of such uh, in in CTS in particular uh, being such a common uh, diagnosis. And again, why I think it's so relevant to talk about the data because, really, um, from a from, from a really good evidence perspective, we see this, and you have either consistent nocturnal splinting to provide them, or um, you know refer them to surgery. And there's nothing sort of in that in that sort of middle band of of um, aggressiveness that we have to offer. Uh, except now sort of hydro dissection, which I would say is, is very evidence-based. So uh, the first uh, the hydro dissection was first kind of described as a minimally invasive procedure to inject fluids into anatomical spaces to facilitate dissection and adhesiolysis during surgery. And this usually involved, you know, using some component of saline or local anesthetic to create previously non-existing uh, surgical planes. So it was used in, started being used in, in breast reconstruction surgery to preserve perforating arteries. It established uh, planes of surgery in ophthalmology, uh, and it preserved function of the neurovascular bundle in radical prostatectomy. Now, before I go into using it for entrapment neuropathies, the physiatrist and what I get always from my colleagues is, you know, heart bringing needles to an already entrapped uh, nerve, um, you know, in a place where it may be strangulated, um, there's not much space, and you're bringing a needle to it. Uh, and I have to explain that, you know, it, it, the anesthetist colleagues are doing this all the time. Uh, some of them perform intraneural blocks. And in one study where they had 72 cases of ultrasound confirmed intraneural injection, um, there was no sort of post-operative sort of sequelae from that. So again, I don't make a habit of, of, of going into to nerves, um, but when balancing that risk reward ratio in offering something that could potentially help the patient, uh, I do keep that in the back of my mind. That this is a fairly safe procedure. So, um, you know, again, this involves using local anesthetic and taking the, the oral saline and taking the nerve off of its surrounding structures. Smith et al. first described this in, in uh, median nerve in terms of trying to take it off the flexor retinaculum uh, or the uh, transverse carpal ligament, which is the superior border in the, the carpal tunnel, which was thought maybe it'll reduce this, the mechanical strangulation uh, and ischemia and therefore reduce some of the symptoms. And this has been sort of the similar mode of thought for other um, techniques that have been described for cubital tunnel syndrome lateral femoral cutaneous neuropathy, and infrapatella saphenous neuralgia after TKR. So when I look at the data, and again, I look at this, and it comes in 2014, and I know, you know, Philip Pang and all my anesthesia colleagues were already kind of doing these for entrapment neuropathies, but the first one that I could see um, in the musculoskeletal literature comes at, uh, out of the ACSM, um, where they talk about this um, uh, uh, hydro dissection in a patient uh, with some 3 cc's of lidocaine and some uh, methylprednisone and uh, has great benefit for sort of at two month follow-up uh, mark. Then, you know, you get these techniques. This is an Austrian group who started in, in muscle and nerve again, a very, for, for the electromyographers, for those studying peripheral nerve, neuromuscular disease, which is, you know, our most sort of salient um, publication. Uh, they start to describe in a cadaveric studies, you know, um, a proof of principle for, uh, approaches at entrapment sites, uh, sites specifically, um, with a specific uh, discussion around an attempt to to uh, hydro dissect. The first sort of clinical study around doing it in entrapment, um, with in a, terms of a case series, this was ten uh, consecutive patients in a study by Choi, uh, where they were looking at ulnar neuropathy at the elbow, and they described this approach of coming in with the needle at the medial epicondyle and making, here's the ulnar nerve and making a specific attempt to hydro dissect it at the cubital tunnel off of the medial, uh, medial epicondyle. And there was, you know, some improvement, for example, in the VAS, they improved at week one, week four, uh, and in terms of uh, changes of the cross-sectional area. So entrapped nerves, especially at the inlet uh, of, of uh, entrapment, uh, the cross-sectional area increases. Uh, and uh, there was a decrease in these patients. 
Of course, the problem here is in a case series like anything, you you get into the problem of is this just a regression of the mean? Are these patients just getting better because uh, there's no control group? So again, one thing things that makes us excited as electromyographers is when we see a, a sort of objective electrophysiological uh, changes for for the better when their electrophysiological severity score in this case improved at both the weeks one and week four. But again, there's no control group. Um, but again, there are, you know, there's more literature that, that rehab physicians and, and musculoskeletal physicians are realizing, um, you know, th that there, there may be this, this, this role for this hydro dissection. Again, in muscle and nerve, uh, then uh, this was in 2018, a study came out in which, again, the authors want to show that we really are making a mechanical change at the carpal tunnel by doing a hydro dissection. Uh, and they made this sort of setup here where um, they had a control group of, of uh, wrists uh, and those that were hydro dissected and compared the amount of glide on the nerve. Now, the amount of glide of a nerve on, on ultrasound is actually an independent risk factor for carpal tunnel that if you have less glide. So if your, your median nerve glides freely below the flexor retinaculum or above the tendons, yeah, uh, uh, that's a good thing. And, and as it starts to reduce that glide, uh, the, the, there's a, a um, association with, with carpal tunnel. So in this study, they did demonstrate that there, there was a change in, in the friction and, and the glide was easier in those that had undergone hydro dissection. So at this point, up until last year, there was evidence in terms of K-series um, pilot studies, um, uh, cadaveric studies, but there was no really good sort of well-designed study until, again, in muscle and nerve, uh, Wu et al.'s group did this uh, study, which now uh, in circles in physiatry and at our center and uh, other centers in Canada and the U.S. Um, have, are talk about it and, and has brought more legitimacy. And even in my clinic, for in terms of my fellows and, and the residents who kind of, you know, think, you know, are, are we really offering the patient here with something with side risk dissection? I would say that this study has had a, a big impact. So, uh, I was going to sp spend about five minutes going through this just because it was such a uh, salient article in, in our world uh, as electrodiagnosticians. So the study was very well designed, very low risk of bias. It was prospective, it was randomized, and it was double-blinded. The most important I th thing, I think, and, and, and even as a takeaway, as an aside, when it comes to interventions um, for pain, I really think it's important that studies seek to have a true control. And by that, I'm, I don't mean usual treatment or splinting but a sham treatment. And we know the, the, the importance of um, dealing with the placebo effect in these studies. We know that met, uh, the intervention group, the, you know, there is a placebo effect that is greater than controls. And we know that's higher in interventions than it is for medications. So it's really important. And if you look at other places where we were initially excited, you know, um, annual plasty for, for disc tears or, or initial sort of, you know, post-operative uh, recovery and PRP injections, before there was treatment concealment, um, you know, or in a true sham, you know, it looks promising. And then as the rigor of the studies get better, the, the evidence becomes a little bit murkier. So uh, I like this, that there was a true sham. And in this case, the, 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 there was the hydro dissection group, and then the, the sham group got a subcutaneous injection. So in total, there were 34 patients. There were more risks because there were some, some people who had bilateral. Uh, and it, there was a mild to moderate CTS that was included. And there were no other co-interventions, which was great. So none of these injections included corticosteroid. It was just the physical effect of the saline. Uh, and they were only allowed Tylenol. Uh, they weren't even allowed splinting, anything else. Uh, patients were 20 to 80 years uh, of age. They had your typical three months of you know, symptoms from nocturnal, postural, overreduce related pain and dysesthesia, uh, relieved by vigorous shaking, and at least one of pain, numbness in the median nerve category, uh, territory, atrophy or reduced strength of the inner muscles, and provocative maneuvers such as Tenels and Phalens. And then the electrodiagnostic criteria for those electrodiagnostics out, uh, uh, diagnosticians out there. They, they included mild and moderate according to the Padua classification. So an abnormal sensory nerve conduction velocity was mild. And if you started getting a, a change in your distal motor latency, you were plugged into moderate. And they excluded other confounding um, disease states. So in the intervention group, so, and this is how we do it clinically at our, our center, um, we go that the scaphoid PZ form level using ultrasound. In this case, the patients actually turned their head away so they didn't know what they were getting. 
uh, and they did three CCs on the top layer. So the median nerve getting sort of peeled off the transverse carpal ligament or the flexor retinaculum, and then another two CCs to take it off the flexor tendons below. Uh, and as I said, the control was a sub Q injection and the injections were done the same way. And then they did a, a, a post a procedure scan to ensure that the appropriate sort of uh, injection had been provided. So again, for those who are not familiar with, with ultrasound, uh, we're doing a, a sort of cross-sectional sort of uh, plane here, and we're doing something called an in-plane injection like this. And here in this cross-section, just to orient uh, those who are not familiar with this, this is the flexor retinaculum here. Here are the flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus underneath. In the intervention group, they are bringing three cc's to try to peel this, the median nerve layer off of here. And then another two cc's sort of under the FDS, uh, FDP to take it off of that. And in the uh, control group here, it's a sub-Q injection above the flexor retinaculum, which shouldn't have any impact on, on the median nerve underneath. In terms of the outcome measures, a very validated, they, did that, they, they looked at one, two, three, and six months out. They used the Boston Carpal Tunnel Questionnaire, which is very validated. It has two scales of it, symptom severity scale, functional status scale, and then secondary outcomes, the cross-sectional uh, area, as well as the electrodiagnostic uh, changes, so the sensory nerve conduction velocities and the distal motor latency. I'm not going to go into this in detail, but they were equal at baseline for all important uh, things. So in terms of the functional severity scale, uh, they, the problem was there were multiple outcome uh, t times of outcomes between the two groups. So they had to correct for it with a Bonferroni correction. And so instead of the normal 0.05 uh, threshold of, of, of a p-value, it had to be 0.01. And it still made that rigorous um, sort of level at, at, at months uh, two and three, just didn't sort of make it at six months. And there was a similar trend in terms of the, the um, functional uh, status scale. There was this, this clear trend to being better um, but didn't quite make it. But significance in the symptom severity scale at two and three months. And then again, what would have gotten a lot of us electrodiagnosticians excited was if the objective parameters reached significance, and they almost did. But again, with that Bonferroni correction, just didn't meet threshold, which is a shame. I think if the study had a few more risks, it would have it would have uh, you know clearly demonstrated that. But the cross-sectional area at all points of the study was very significantly uh, reduced. Uh, so. You know, I, I think all in all, amongst my colleagues, uh, you know, when we bring this up at, at journal club rounds, um, when we discuss it at the, the, the National Canadian Conference, we, we, we like to know that, yeah, there's this, you know, extra tool that we have that has uh, an evidence basis for it, uh, which we know the anesthetists have been doing for quite some time. So just uh, this is, uh, again, the median nerve here. I, I just uh, I come in with a in this approach. I use the radial approach. I uh, put a little local anesthetic to take it off the flexor retinaculum. Uh, and then I bring in uh, the bigger needle, the 21 gauge. And this is the ulnar neurovascular bundle here, the tendons. And... Here's that attempt to take it off the FCR. Uh, this isn't my best work because uh, ideally I would have liked to take it off the flexor uh, tendons underneath, but I was already about five cc's just to get it off the FCR. Um, and uh, so I bailed. And then I do just add some cortisone uh, to it uh, for some evidence that there is symptomatic benefit, although it doesn't change disease course. But the exciting thing about hydrodistension now is that, you know, there is something that potentially can, can change a uh, disease course. So uh, that's it. Um, opening it up to any questions. Thank you so much. Hal. That was, that was really good. I think, you know, you took us through the hydrodyne section and the, the study that you presented, I think with regards to the pain studies, I think sham is something that's very important. The sham group is so important and we know there's a placebo effect as well. So I think it's very important to actually consider that as a part of the research. All right. We have a question here. Uh, question is on, uh, uh is it better to do fenestration of uh, flexor retinaculum at the same time as you would do hydro dissection? Okay. Yeah. Is yeah. That that's a, that, that's a good, that's a, that's a good question. Um, we've at our center kind of flirted with, with both. Um, I, th this one, it just, um, I, I would say that I think the, the evidence for benefit, um, 
uh, at the last that I looked at it for fenestration was in that realm of, of kind of, uh, you know, large case series. But, um, uh, you know, again, uh, to, to add that to this, I think, I think that's, that's reasonable. Um, I think that's an excellent question. I think, again, I think that it behooves, it brings us to our bigger point. It behooves us to do really good studies so we can tell our patients, yes, this has clear evidence of benefit. And then, you know, you have multiple um, tools in your armament to, to, to help your patient. I think if you ask from my point of view as well, sometimes patients who undergo carpal tunnel surgery still continue to have the pain, right? So even though they have had flex retinoculum released, but the problem still to still still persists. I think it's the it's the microcirculation to the nerve, you know. I think, and that's where the hydrodissection makes a big difference because you're releasing the pressure from the surrounding scar tissue or surrounding tendons. And oh, absolutely, uh, I, I think a, a release of the flexor retinacum also only gets a, a, the the superior sort of adhesion. It doesn't do anything off the, the flexor tendons, really. I mean, they do a bit of a neurolysis at the time, but it hasn't really been released. But um, I, I, I absolutely think that there's there's many mo modes of, of why someone has uh, a neuropathy and ischemia and strangulation and, and mechanical traction and, and neurovascular uh, circulatory supply all sort of come into play. I've definitely done this on uh, uh, failed uh, wrists with some benefit and, and recurrent carpal tunnel post-release. Uh, the question we have here, what is the best injected? So what do you use? Do you use dextrose? Do you use uh, local anesthetic? Or do I, you I, have, uh, I have just been using local anesthetic and uh, saline. Um, again, I, if, if anybody else has uh, you know, thoughts on, on something that seems to be sort of superior in their experience, and that's what it comes down to. We're, I think a lot of these are, are recipes that we, we like and, and seem to have worked. So I use 40 milligrams of Depomedrol. Uh, and uh, a total of five cc's of, in, of injectate. Five, five uh, of uh, total volume. Total volume, five mils. Four mils of local anesthetic, either yeah. lignocaine or pupivacaine. Okay, yeah. right. So now we have a question from Rajni. Rajni was our, uh, you know, my, my predecessor in Toronto, Rajni Sundarajan. So Rajni is asking the question that how long does the hydrodive section last? You know, this is where I have been incredibly uh, sort of happy is that I have patients who, with nerve blocks elsewhere, uh, I've been somewhat underwhelmed in terms of the, the duration of, of benefit. In this, done in this manner, uh, in, in carpal tunnel, it's, it's months. And we have patients who come in once every six months, once every nine months, uh, and then others who last you know four or five months. But unlike some of the other blocks where they, they, they want it repeated after several weeks, three months, this one seems to have much more longevity to it. Right, and uh, you have just question: Do you do you have same results when you have patients after surgery coming to you because of pain, still pain? Uh, it's a, a wide spectrum, uh, Amr. Wide spectrum, I'd say. Yeah, Th those who I think, uh, you know, if if they haven't had a a uh, any improvement, uh, and I think this is the. Uh, the the work the extensive work by Robinson, one of the gurus, is that if it, that that middle band uh, is helped by release surgeries, but those who have had persistent neuropathic pain because of end stage uh, axonal loss, so they have no thenar eminence anymore, they have no sensories on their electrodiagnostics, it's kind of missed the boat. And 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 um, I, I would say with those same, I've, I've been kind of underwhelmed with the with the the, the uh, response. But if somebody had a release, they had benefit, and then, um, you know, they've had recurrent seven, eight years later, I, I would say I, I get an, you know, a, fair, a very good response. Have here. How many sessions of hydrodissection are needed? So, you know, do you kind of do it repeatedly, like a set of three or set of four? Or I haven't done that. I, and I know there's a lot of people who do, and, and, and there's some literature supporting the, the series of blocks. I, I haven't. I have been doing it uh, essentially on a PRN basis. Um, if the symptoms come back, then, then we'll do it again. Okay. And, uh, you know, we have a question from Suhaib Nazel saying, you know, do you give the uh, hydrodization just below the flexor retinoculum or do you go above the ten, above the nerve or below the nerve? What's your... I, 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 I attempt to get them off both layers. So I try to get under, off the flexor retinoculum and then off of the profundus, uh, the, the superficialis tendons as well. Uh, that That's the hope, but some of them are just so, and you, you can, you can see it. It wasn't well demonstrated in this one, but you can see some of them are just so stubbornly 
kind of attached mm-hmm. and adhesed and 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 you know you're, you're you can just see it slowly sort of peeling away and i can't imagine that that doesn't when you look at normal wrist and, and glide like if you take your fpl you just use your thumb like this on a normal wrist there's a there's some glide to the median nerve with movement of the flexor tendons and you know you can't help but think an individual who has that as your hydro dissecting that there isn't a component of this mechanical strangulation occurring right uh, and uh, another question that I have here is, uh, is there a risk of injury to the recurrent motor branch if, we, if you do a subligamentous injection? So, so you know, uh, yes, um, I, I think, you know, and there's, there's variants of, of, of where and, and, you know, if you have a nice cart based system, sometimes you can, you can, you can identify it. Um, but, uh, again, we, we, we make that, that, uh, it, it is a risk. I hasn't, I haven't seen it. I think it's low, um, you know, to, to, uh, lose, you know, motor function, um, w- with this approach, I don't think is, uh, is, you know, all that, um, Bob, do all you that high. The ulnar approach, or do you go the radial approach? Which is your uh, it depends on the morphology morphology of the wrist. Ulnar, I think more people do, um, but sometimes you just don't get that that concavity where the ulnar nerve vascular bundle is low enough that I feel safe enough to come in. Kind of, uh, I feel like there's a little bit more room on the radial side. In either case, I always do an Allen's test um, uh, to to ensure that they're profuse from both sides. Okay, right. And uh, now, uh, sorry, go on, Abdullah. Do you, uh, have uh, you prefer to do a short axis view, r- radial to uh, lateral to medial, or medial to lateral, or in plane, long axis view uh, from distal to proximal? So, so I do a uh, in plane cross sectional, short axis, either yeah. from ulnar or radial side. Okay, same here. I because agree. some uh, mm-hmm. some physicians they do like uh, from distal to proximal long yes. axis because it covers yeah. So it's segment. like a similar it's like a similar view to if you were doing a fenestration. Mm. Right, correct. Is that what you mean? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, thank you. I've got I've got a question. So you know, have you ever tried patients who've actually done hydro dissection, but things haven't actually improved, going a bit more proximal? and doing a forearm median nerve block followed by a pulse radio frequency. That is a true anesthetist. This is the right there. <laughs> anesthetists always want to go proximal too, right? We, we think entrapment, entrapment, entrapment. That's it, right? We, we, don't, we, don't, we don't want to do S1 foramen. We want to go to L5, S1 where the disc herniation is. Um, you know, I, 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 you know it's, it's probably my failure that not to have considered that, that you know, is this uh, entrapment occurring at sublimus bridge, uh, the, you know, biceps aponeurosis, like, you know, higher up levels of, of pathology. Um, something to consider. I, I haven't, uh, Sadiq, to be honest. Now that, you know, I've had a case where I've done the, you know, this was a patient with chronic post-surgical pain. So I had a carpal tunnel surgery, had a, had a kind of, you know, hypertrophic scar, and she was advised to do scar massage and all that. And I did the hydrodissection, but things didn't get improved. So I thought, well, she probably has got a central sensitization. So I just thought, well, before I give up, I might just go a bit more proximal and do did a block followed by a pulse radio frequency. So I actually did both in the same setting. So I just put the local anesthetic and, and pulsed it for five minutes. Now, I, God knows how the pulse radio frequency works. There, yeah. there, there are lots of postulates, there are lots of theories. But, you know, it worked for in her case. So I thought, you know, I just flagged that up. So that's what I've done. Obviously, yeah. not, not, there's no RCT you know, or, that, you know, these, these are basically like case reports, anecdotal kind of, you know, case reports where people have yeah. done it worked for their patient. But that, there is an option. So I thought, you know, I just mentioned that. Yeah, no, I, and I think that's great. And again, you know, I think we, we extrapolate from the, the some good literature around suprascapular nerve blockade at the uh, at the shoulder that, and at the suprascapular nerve um uh, in a superior oh, trunk and, superior trunk you mean entry entry approach superior trunk. Superior trunk. Superior trunk. yeah near 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 omohyoid muscles sub omohyoid pulse star f of the super scalp so i think a lot of people are doing that yeah. as well great thank you so much Hab. that was fantastic really, really thanks good. guys you know, fantastic right amar do you have anything to sort of you know comment any questions do you have i think no, we- perfect we, we covered the Nice topics today. Yes, I think we'll probably really? have to call it a day yeah. because, you know, we, but no, it was great. I think, uh, you know, we, we managed to keep 
everyone glued to the chairs. We've got now 85 people still online. It was quite good. I think with regards to the, uh, you know, I think online events or webinars, I think three hours is max people would stick around because after that it gets tiring. So, but thank you so much, guys. Really appreciate you. you all giving your time. And there was a great talk. And I think our inaugural kind of webinar for the rehab section has been, been a great hit. I think we had a good turnout and really appreciate you guys putting your efforts in. Okay. And uh, we'll okay. see you around half sometime in Dubai. Right. Okay, okay, man. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Happy New Year, guys. Okay. Take care then. Happy New Year. Bye. Bye. Bye.